Few shows can truly claim to be iconic, and even fewer can be called one of the greatest of all time. All in the Family is one of those rare shows. At the height of its popularity, over 20 million American households tuned in to watch the Bunkers and Stivics grapple with modern issues and topics that hadn't been seen on a sitcom before. It was the top-rated show on television for five years straight, and all of its cast members were awarded Emmys for their performances. While a few other shows have accomplished one of those things, no other show can say it's done both. All in the Family ushered in a new wave of topical television that spoke to the real-world issues of the average person, and it changed television history. To understand All in the Family's impact, we have to first understand that particular moment in time. In the years ahead of the show's debut in 1971, the civil rights movement, backlash to the war in Vietnam, and the women's liberation movement were all examples of political unrest that were shaking up American culture. But there was one part of American culture that largely seemed to be ignoring that new reality, and that was television. Dennis Treaty described television comedies at the time as falling into three broad categories, though I'm going to focus specifically on the two categories covering sitcoms. The first was rural sitcoms that focused on families or locales from small towns, such as the Beverly Hillbillies, Green Acres, and Petticoat Junction. And the other common type were fantasy sitcoms that used some kind of science fiction or magical element, such as Bewitched, I Dream of Jeannie, and The Addams Family. There were, of course, exceptions, such as The Dick Van Dyke Show. But generally speaking, very few sitcoms were set in cities following the lives of people from cities something that would be unthinkable looking at the state of sitcoms in the decades that followed. The world was changing outside the small box in people's living rooms, and as the baby boomers were entering their 20s, networks took notice of this newly emerging demographic of socially aware young people, and that was being made even more salient by more demographic data starting to be collected in the television ratings. Josh Ozersky and Archie Bunker's America wrote, Originally a category of 18 to 49 had sufficed then 18 to 35 and 35 to 49 in helped ratings harvesters. By 1970, viewers from 18 to 34, 18 to 49, and 25 to 49 were represented, along with the bookend categories of 12 to 17 and 50 plus. At the time, CBS, the future home of All in the Family, was the most watched network of the big three, the other two networks being NBC and ABC. However, once they started getting more demographic information on their ratings, the picture became more complicated. While it was true CBS had the highest overall ratings of the three networks, CBS attracted an older audience with nights that featured Petticoat Junction and Green Acres, whereas NBC and ABC would appeal to younger audiences with shows such as Batman, Star Trek, and The Mod Squad. And this growing younger audience, with its disposable income, was very attractive to advertisers who would pay a premium to reach them. CBS did make an attempt to reach that younger audience with the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, it used sketch comedy and musical performances to make coded references to smoking pot and openly criticize the Vietnam War. In spite of its success, in 1969 it would be cancelled by new CBS president Robert Wood, supposedly because a tape was delivered late. The Smothers Brothers would go on to successfully sue CBS in 1973 for $776,300, and they would consistently claim that they weren't cancelled by CBS so much as they were fired. CBS would replace the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour with the far less trendy Hee Haw. Although this seemed to signal that the network was renewing its commitment to more traditional programming, Robert Wood would instead go in the opposite direction with the rest of the schedule, cancelling a number of other programs that appealed to a more traditional audience. Trudy described it writing, The Great Rural Purge of 1970-71. to In this shocking move, CBS abruptly cancelled or wound down nearly all of its most popular sitcoms, from Mayberry and the Beverly Hillbillies to Green Acres, among others, and comedy hours, including those of Red Skelton, Jackie Gleason, and even Ed Sullivan, all among the top shows on television, in order to bring in a new generation of more urban and younger audiences. Although highly rated, many of these shows were very expensive to produce, and attracted an older audience less favored by advertisers. Wood would go on to use the term relevance as what he wanted to see in the new programs for CBS. He was going after that younger audience. But the push for a younger audience wasn't the only factor at play here. The Nixon administration, which had a chilly relationship with the media, was planning to use the FCC to pressure networks into providing them better coverage. One memo from inside the administration read, The real problem that faces this administration is to get this unfair coverage in such a way that we make a major impact on a basis which the networks, newspapers, and Congress will react to and begin to look at this somewhat differently. We can utilize the Antitrust Division to investigate various media relating to antitrust violation. 
Even the possible threat of antitrust action, I think, would be effective in changing their views in the above matter. One of the new measures deployed against the networks was to force them to hire independent production companies to create TV programming, rather than letting the networks do it internally. This was designed to undercut the power of the networks to control what appeared on the airwaves, though ironically it created an opening for far more liberal independent production companies to get their show on the air, the exact type of voices the Nixon administration would regularly rail against. One of the first shows to debut on CBS because of these changing dynamics in ratings information and government pressure was the Mary Tyler Moore Show in 1970. A few months later, it would be joined by All in the Family. Before talking about the premiere in All in the Family, we have to go back and look at another story about its creator and how he arrived at this idea. Norman Lear had been working in show business for about 20 years, primarily as a comedy writer. In 1959, he teamed up with Bud Yorkin to form a production company with Lear writing and Yorkin directing. They called their company Tandem Productions. The duo found success with several movies throughout the 1960s, but the biggest stroke of inspiration would strike later in the decade, and it would come from across the Atlantic. Till Death Us Do Part was an English sitcom created by Johnny Spate. Debuting in 1965, it followed the exploits of the working-class Garnet family. Alf, played by Warren Mitchell, and his wife, Else, played by Dandy Nichols, had a combative relationship, frequently getting caught up in yelling matches. And living with them were their daughter Rita, played by Una Stubbs, and her husband Mike, played by Anthony Booth. Anthony, being a socialist and Alf being a conservative, would frequently butt heads over political issues that reflected the generation gap in Britain. This dynamic made it a big hit in Britain, and it ran for seven series, totaling 54 episodes. It even spawned several international versions in the Netherlands, Israel, Brazil, and Germany. And it would be finding its way to the United States as well. There's some conflicting accounts about who found out about the series first. In most versions of the story Norman Lear tells, he said he read an article about Till Death Us Do Part in either TV Guide or Variety, and a flash of inspiration hit him. A paragraph about this British show, about a uh, father and a son-in-law who fought about everything politically. They... Bud Yorkin remembers having brought up the show to Lear first and sending him a tape. I saw that show. I couldn't believe anybody could put that on television. And I sent that. I sent a tape back to Norm. Lear would say in later interviews that Yorkin mentioned the show to him, although there is some historical evidence to show that there was an article about Till Death Us Do Part in Variety around the time Lear says he read it. So the truth might be a combination of all of these stories. What no one disputes is that it was Norman Lear who had the idea to bring this sitcom to the U.S. That was Norman's idea totally of trying to do it here. Lear was reminded of the relationship he had with his own father and the arguments between the two of them. We fought about all of these things. My father used to call me the laziest white kid he ever met. Lear began working on his idea having watched little to none of Till Death Us Do Part, though he would later incorporate several ideas from that series in episodes of what would become All in the Family. The American version of the series would make a number of changes from the original British one. Alf would become Archie, Else would become Edith, Rita became Gloria, and Mike became Richard, though that name of Richard wouldn't last. More than changing character names, the sitcom was tailored to suit American audiences, and a new character was added to the mix. Leonardo Bonomo describes it writing, Knowing that in the U.S. the issue of race relations was more sensitive than in Britain, Lear always made an effort to incorporate a strong rebuttal of Archie's views in the show. Archie encounters a recurring character of the series, the Jefferson son Lionel, a bright, articulate young man who takes particular pleasure in making fun of his bigoted white neighbor. Norman Lear shared his thoughts about the limitations of the original series, saying, Till Death Us Do Part did stick figures. The characters simply fought, and the shows were about nothing more than the argument. Lear wanted to explore why these issues were so volatile within American society, and perhaps create a better understanding of both sides of the divide. The series would break from sitcom traditions in the United States and focus on a family living in New York City, dealing with contemporary issues that modern Americans faced in the real world. With this idea in hand, Lear brought his pitch to ABC, and in 1968 he would produce a pilot for a series called Justice for All. The first major casting decision for this nascent series would be the one that would make or break it, and that's the casting of the show's patriarch, Archie Justice, a character who would later be renamed Archie Bunker. Archie was heavily modeled off of Lear's father, not just in temperament, but some of Archie's most memorable lines came from him. Norman Lear described his father saying, We never agreed about anything. We fought about everything. I'd tell him he was a bigot, he'd call me a goddamn bleeding heart liberal, and we were both right, but also wrong. He would say, you're a meathead, dead from the neck up. 
Several actors were considered for the role, including Mickey Rooney and Jackie Gleason, but it was the lesser-known Carol O'Connor who captured Lear's attention in his audition. Carol O'Connor came in and sat down and started to talk in the character of Archie Bunker. And he was, though I could never have known it, Archie Bunker. At the time, O'Connor had been a character actor who had appeared in many movies and TV shows. In the late 1960s, O'Connor had been under contract with ABC, which may be why he was in the audition to begin with. When he saw the script, O'Connor was sure a show that delved into such weighty topics wouldn't last. I thought that such a storm of protest would go up that we'd be off the air in a few weeks. Even so, O'Connor did see a lot of potential in the idea, and he appreciated it as satire. Unlike the archer he would play, O'Connor was quite a sophisticated guy, and Norman Lear credits him for giving the character much of his feel. In one interview, O'Connor describes how he shaped Archie's character from the very beginning. He said some people thought he should be from Texas since he was a bigot, and I said, no, no make him a New York Cockney. The guy in the English show was a, was a London Cockney. There was also some immediate friction between Lear and O'Connor, as the actor took the liberty to rewrite much of the pilot. In an interview years later, O'Connor would claim that his version of the script was the one that was ultimately used. I, I rewrote the script all in pencil. Then I had no typist, so I recorded the entire script on a tape. She made a script out of it, and that's the script we did for the pilot. However, in his autobiography, Even This I Get to Experience, Norman Lear would say otherwise. Two days later, he came to talk further about the script. He'd done a little work on it, he said, and hoped I liked it. Actually, he had rewritten the first act entirely, the second act to come. And now I had the first of hundreds of difficult moments with Carol O'Connor, many of them extremely difficult on both sides. At times, they were murderously difficult. I was sick to my stomach at the thought of losing him, and that first moment concluded with my telling Carol that I was committed to my script, as was the network, and it was the script he had to commit to also. Through his agent, he did. In the 2023 book, All in the Family, the show that changed television, the first page of the first draft of the script is shown, including some handwritten corrections. It doesn't match up with what we can hear in the first pilot, but it's hard to say who changed what and when before it was ultimately taped. As a character, Archie was a bigot, a loudmouth, and very abrasive. Though outside of that nasty shell, he was portrayed as having an inner spark of goodness, something you could easily miss when he's in the middle of one of his rants. Last time I seen him lifting a hand around here, he was testing his deodorant. <laughs> the other major casting decision before the first pilot was Jean Stapleton as Archie's wife, Edith. Lear had noticed her on Broadway, either in a production of Bells Are Ringing or Damn Yankees, depending on which of the two of them you ask. Stapleton did appear in both productions, though. When she saw the script, I said, this is wonderful stuff, uh, I, I, and amazed that it was, could be on TV. Lear helped Stapleton understand the character as someone who had grown accustomed to her abrasive husband, whereas in Till Death Us Do Part, which would see Elle snap back at her foolish husband Alf, Edith would instead tune Archie out. When Stapleton asked, when he's saying some of these things, you know, Edith would never want to hear, what am I thinking? Where's my head? Lear replied, you're tuned out. You're Patty Andrews, the middle Andrews sister, and you're singing, don't sit under the apple tree. Stapleton would later describe Edith in an interview. Not uh, well educated, but uh, a great sense of uh, wisdom and heart. Stapleton also developed a unique voice for Edith, one that was somehow both cloying and endearing. I didn't have no million people out there marching and protesting to get me my job. No, his uncle got it for him. The other two actors cast for the first pilot were Kelly Jean Peters as the Justice's daughter Gloria and Tim McIntyre as her husband Richard. They would be joined by D'Urville Martin as Lionel, a friend of the family who helped with small jobs around the house. The pilot's intro is very much in the spirit of what the series would eventually become, with Archie and Edith singing Those Were the Days over a series of shots leading from the hustle and bustle of the city to the quiet neighborhood of the Justice family. This theme would be used throughout the series' run, and it was written by Charlie Strauss and Lee Adams. The pilot's plot was Richard and Gloria planning an anniversary party for Archie and Edith. The story is very simple, allowing us to get a good idea of who these characters are and how they relate to each other. Archie is from an older generation and not very impressed by the antics of his daughter Gloria and her husband Richard. Two whole years it was, there was nothing. I mean nothing. Not till a wedding night. And even then... 
Not only was that a solid takedown from Edith, it was also rather shocking to see sex so openly discussed in a show intended to air in 1968. We also get an idea of the many fights between Archie and his son-in-law, including the first time we hear his iconic nickname. Well, who else should I blame it on, Meathead? The pilot successfully established a lot of what we would see in the final version of the series. ABC was a bit wary of putting the show on the air. Even though they reportedly thought it was funny, it was a bit more controversial than they might have liked. Rather than let Norman Lear take the show somewhere else, though, they held on to the show for another year and had Lear make a second version of the pilot. The second pilot would be titled Those Were the Days, and two of the actors would be recast. Candy Azara would be the new Gloria, and Chip Oliver the new Richard. And in the Bible you read where so-and-so is damned for cheating or stealing or committing insects in a family. <laughs> ABC still passed on the series, which might have been for the best, as the chemistry between the characters, particularly between Archie and Richard, wasn't quite right. You said I was the laziest white man you ever met. Well, what's the matter with that? White man you ever met? Right. You. Implying the blacks are even lazier? Hold it, meathead. Hold it there. Norman Lear expressed why he believed the second pilot was passed over by ABC. So everybody laughed, but they were afraid of it. Another reason ABC might have passed on the pilot is because of the failure of a series called Turn On, a show that was so poorly received it was canceled during its debut episode. Its edgy style of humor that had turned off local affiliates had put the network on guard and they didn't want to take a similar chance with All in the Family. In an interview, Michael Eisner, who worked at ABC at the time, recalled, Elton Rule, the ABC network president, simply said, I can't go back to our affiliates after Turn On and ask them to go put on All in the Family. I just can't do it. Freed of his commitment to ABC, Lear was able to take All in the Family elsewhere, and that elsewhere happened to be CBS, which was looking for programming that fit under the label of relevance. Although CBS asked for a new pilot, Norman Lear pushed to go straight to making it a series. He wanted me to make another pilot. And I said, I, I, I won't make another pilot. I'll make a first show. The CBS version of the show would once again need to recast some roles. Gloria and Richard, who would be renamed Michael, would need to be replaced. And so would Lionel. For Michael, Rob Reiner was cast. He and Norman Lear had some history together as Lear was friends with Rob's father, Carl Reiner. And Lear had watched Rob grow up. A funny exchange between the two about Rob was recorded in the book Archie and Edith, Mike and Gloria. Noted Lear to Carl Reiner, You've got a funny kid there, answered Papa Carl. Get out of here, he's not a funny kid. Years after, Carl Reiner expanded on the exchange. Oh, I knew the kid was funny. A funny kid can't help being funny. What I didn't know until a long time later was that he had talent. Rob Reiner had originally auditioned for the role of the son-in-law character for the first version of the pilot in 1968. But Lear considered him too young for the role. In a stroke of good luck, now a few years down the road, Reiner was much more suited to the role. Between the production of the first two pilots and the third, Reiner had performed on the Andy Griffith series Headmaster, a series he was also writing for at the time. His performance showed a level of improvement that made Norman Lear take notice. As for the character Reiner played, Michael Stivick, no longer Richard, he was meant to be a character of a left-wing activist. Norman Lear described him as the opposite of Rob Reiner, writing in his book, Rob Reiner, he takes the responsibility for knowing the history of his subject, and understanding it as well in a political, social, and economic context. Mike Stivick was his opposite. Full of passion, absent the facts. Michael was frequently butting heads with Archie, more so than either of the earlier versions of the son-in-law character. This one could give it back to Archie with just as much passion and fury. Sometimes being so loud denouncing Archie, he was unaware of his own shortcomings. I think you're a marvel. You know, I can even set my watch by how long it takes you to belch after a bicarb. <laughs> Sally Struthers was cast as Gloria. She had recently appeared alongside Jack Nicholson in Five Easy Pieces, though Lear had noticed her appearing elsewhere. And Sally Struthers I had seen at the top of the Smothers Brothers show. They were However, it may have been the Tim Conway comedy hour Lear saw her in where she performed as the lone dancer poking fun of the show's lack of a budget. Da, 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 da. I think I have my pants! During her audition, Struthers was suffering from laryngitis, and she remembered getting a big laugh trying to argue with the hoarse voice. It was enough to get her another audition, and eventually she got the role of Gloria Stivick. At the time, Struthers was convinced she would lose the role to Penny Marshall, since she had been dating Rob Reiner at the time, and Struthers assumed that Marshall and Reiner would have better chemistry together. Struthers recounts asking Lear how she got the role. I asked Norman, how the hell did I land this role? Was I the funniest one in the auditions? And he explained that the writers had considered what would make better storylines, if Gloria were closer to her mother or if she were daddy's little girl. 
We decided Daddy's little girl had more story opportunities, Norman explained. And you look an awful lot like Carol. You've got the same round face with blue eyes. Gloria was one of the quieter roles in the earlier seasons, often there to move the action along rather than be the center of it. Though as the years progressed, she became a much bigger part of the series, taking charge in a number of episodes that explored what it meant to be a young woman in a rapidly changing world. He set the alarm to wake himself up every two hours all night long so that he could gargle and take his pills and wheeze over his inhaler for ten minutes. You know something, Michael? When you're sick, you're sick! <laughs> one other character was recast for the pilot, albeit one that wasn't in the principal cast. Mike Evans would be taking up the role of Lionel. His route to being cast was perhaps the most unusual as he wasn't really an actor and had merely caught a ride with someone while hitchhiking who happened to be headed to this audition. This unnamed actor took Evans along with him, and Evans, not being entirely sure of how the process worked, accidentally signed up for the audition. When he was called in, he was such a natural that he was cast in the role. Lionel served as a means to undercut Archie's bigotry, slyly mocking his backwards attitudes. Although he would only appear in a handful of episodes of All in the Family, he and the rest of the Jeffersons made enough of an impression to earn a spin-off of their own. I mean, if they start pumping our blood into you white folks, well, who knows what might happen? You could all turn black. <laughs> this newly cast version of the former pilot script would set the template for what an episode of the series would look like going forward. The set was given a sepia tone to it, as if we were looking at faded photographs, and characters dressed in drab clothing to reflect their less-than-privileged status. Pulling from his memory, Norman Lear put Archie's chair in a position of prominence, one that would reflect the special significance that this piece of furniture had to Archie. It took on an almost sacred quality as to who was, and was not, allowed to sit on it. This first episode also broke tradition with other sitcoms of the time by being taped rather than filmed, and being recorded in front of a live studio audience. The tape was used because it was cheaper than film, and while the live audience wasn't exactly an innovation, sitcoms were doing that back in the 1950s, it was a change from the shows of the 1960s that typically opted to use the laugh track. The changes gave the series a surge of energy, as they were often performed more like a play, usually taking no more than 40 minutes to perform for the audience. They would typically record two performances a night, often making revisions in between them, and then editing together the footage of the best takes. And they occasionally stayed late to pick up scenes and moments that perhaps had not been adequately captured in the earlier performances. Before it could be allowed on the air, All in the Family faced some real challenges from the network. Although the network president Robert Wood championed the show, other executives at CBS were less impressed. According to television historian Richard Adler, Wood was fully aware that the show was fraught with problems, but he also believed that it had the potential to be a runaway hit. Wood's enthusiasm for All in the Family was not shared by his fellow executives at CBS, however. Their skepticism was confirmed by the network's audience tests. Christina von Hodenberg noted in her book, Television's Moment, the show's pilot had tested terribly with sample audiences both for ABC and CBS, which rated it below average. Thus, the CBS research department predicted that the show would fail, but kept the door open a crack. We believe that many viewers were ashamed to admit, in the test situation, to enjoying certain programs. Although we think it unlikely, this program may be a worthwhile entry. CBS had already given All in the Family a 13-episode commitment, and ahead of the premiere, they were growing increasingly wary. They began to pressure Norman Lear to change the order of the episodes and put the tamer second episode ahead of the first. Lear refused and was quoted as saying, I felt we had to get the network wet completely. Once you're completely wet, you can't get wetter. I wanted the audience to hear all of Archie's epithets, to see his sexual hangups, to meet the whole family. They were also pressuring Lear to cut out more offensive parts of the show. One notable example is the line Archie delivers upon discovering Michael and Gloria had been having sex shortly before the bunkers arrived home from church. 11.10 of a Sunday morning. Lear threatened to quit if the line were removed, and the network gave in. Part of his fearlessness wasn't just Lear standing up for his creation. Due to his recent success at the box office, Lear had been offered a three-picture deal from United Artists, a deal so lucrative that his family and friends all urged him to take it. There wasn't anybody in my life that didn't say, beg me to take the three-picture deal. Lear was adamant that he would stick by all in the family, and because he had that backup plan, he was more secure in being determined to do it his way. The first episode, Meet the Bunkers, would premiere on January 12th, 1971 on CBS. And the series was now under a new title, All in the Family. Gloria, you married the laziest white man I ever seen. The premiere of All in the Family followed the familiar story beats of the previous two pilots. 
Only now, the performances were even sharper, with both O'Connor and Stapleton having great chemistry with Reiner and Struthers. One new addition was a warning that the series was intended for a mature audience. That, along with a time slot following the very awkward lead-in of Hee Haw, reflected the lack of faith the network had in the show. Even so, All in the Family was still able to debut with the first episode that established many of its recurring dynamics. Because of the high cost of living, the newly married Michael and Gloria are stuck with Archie and Edith as Michael finishes his education, leading to some friction with Archie. I just want to learn a little bit about society so I can help people. People? Your mother-in-law and me is people. Help us, will you? Go to work. <laughs> the first episode told the audience this was a show that wasn't afraid of tackling many of the hot-button topics other sitcoms would shy away from. It discussed religion, race, and gender. And as the series progressed, it would be touching on even more topical issues. The story's resolution has Edith reading a greeting card she got from Archie, realizing it had been picked out by Michael leading Archie to inadvertently complimenting him. Archie, we're talking about a greeting card. They got some damn good writers writing for them cards. But who had the good taste to pick it out? <laughs> <laughs> Go on, will you, meathead? What this reveals is that, in spite of all his rough edges and their bickering, there's some kind of affection Archie has for Michael, whether he is willing to admit it or not and that this house of yelling and conflict still has some love in it. It also introduces challenging questions for the audience. For one half of the audience, they might ask how we reconcile our love for the older generation in spite of its flaws. And for another part of the audience, it asks if there might be the chance to find something of value in the younger generation. A fun bit of trivia about the poem and the greeting card in that final scene is that it was one Norman Lear had written for his father to give to his mother on their anniversary. His mother never knew that Norman was the one who wrote it, and even after the airing of this episode, she never clued in her son as to whether or not she had figured out who had been the original author of that poem. Von Hodenberg in her book noted a few changes between the pilots for ABC and the episode that was broadcast on CBS. She wrote, The producer maintained that CBS eventually agreed to air the first show with no deletions. Still, a comparison between the pilot tape and the first episode reveals crucial differences. In the broadcast version, the young couple was surprised by the parents' return before and not during intercourse. Gone were the scenes where Mike embraced Gloria from behind when she bent over and chased her up the stairs, and where, on the way back down the stairs, Gloria tucked in her blouse and Mike zipped up his fly. In addition to those changes, the character Richard had been of Irish descent, but the newly renamed and recast Michael was of Polish descent. While some of the jokes cut from the broadcast version seen in the earlier pilots would eventually be used in later episodes, others were never seen again. It's difficult to say precisely why they were cut, and whether or not they were compromises from Norman Lear. It could have easily been the case that the runtime for the first two pilots, of 35 and 27 minutes respectively, needed to be shortened to the under 26 minute runtime of the first episode. Regardless of the changes, it's still undeniable that Lear managed to get on the air an episode of television that was unlike anything else seen up to that point. Just stifle your comments, I'm right what I tell you, don't do nothing more. All in the Family was a deeply political show with a chaotic and messy family. Until then, television had claimed this mantle of neutrality in the majority of its programming, avoiding commenting on the issues of the day. Norman Lear strongly disagreed that that wasn't a political statement. In his biography, he wrote, for 20 years, until All in the Family came along, TV comedy was telling us there was no hunger in America, we had no racial discrimination, there was no unemployment or inflation, no war, no drugs, and the citizenry was happy with whomever happened to be in the White House. Tell me that expressed no point of view. For a show to so boldly challenge this norm, there was a lot of concern from the network that there would be an enormous backlash. They even brought in additional operators to monitor phone calls they expected from viewers outraged by what they saw. Instead, they were met with crickets. That might be because the people weren't really watching. All in the Family debuted to low ratings and a general indifference from the audience, although those who were watching seemed to be keen on it. According to CBS, the relative few who did call in did so mostly to express their pleasure. Critics were divided upon first seeing the show. Some were quick to use terms such as a new low in taste and a wretched program. But at least one critic said that, all in the Family is not just the best written, best directed, and best acted show on television, it's the best show on television. Although not a smash hit right away, or even a modest hit for that matter, All in the Family benefited from debuting in January. Being part of the second half of the season meant it was less likely to be replaced after its initial run in the spring, and people were free to discover it in reruns during the summer. When it went into reruns, so did ABC and NBC. 
and people who had been watching whatever their favorites were on the other networks turned to us. So the ratings started to tick up. The series also had a big boost in their public profile as the cast was asked to open the Emmys that year, introducing the characters to the biggest audience they had been in front of. Norman Lear explained in his biography, With only two weeks to go before the 23rd Emmy broadcast, that year's producer called. The show's host, Johnny Carson, had an idea. What if the Emmys opened with America's most talked about new family, the Bunkers, sitting down together to watch the Emmy broadcast? They do their shtick, Archie hating the whole thing, of course, and Edith loving it, until the Emmys start and cut them off. That night brought even more attention for the Bunkers and the Stivics when they won the awards for Outstanding Actress in a Comedy Series, going to Gene Stapleton, Outstanding New Series, and Outstanding Comedy Series. Very soon after, ratings were starting to pick up. As Donna McCrohan wrote in her book, before the close of 1971, Bud Yorkin asserted a mind-boggling statistic. Recently, we had a 70 share in New York City. Unbelievable. That means 70% of the sets were tuned to us, and the other stations had to split up the rest. There aren't many specials that get a rating like that. By the beginning of 1972, an estimated 50 million plus watched All in the Family on a weekly basis, an unprecedented viewership for a regularly scheduled series. One of the most notable of early objections was a lengthy article published in the New York Times on September 12, 1971. It was titled, As I Listen to Archie Say Heeb, written by Laura Hobson, perhaps best known at the time for being the writer of the novel Gentleman's Agreement, among many others. Hobson's article centered around her desire to figure out why we were supposed to consider a bigot like Archie lovable. Her main point was that the many slurs used on the show, while rough, never quite crossed the line into the more aggressive terms you would hear from a bigot in real life. She wrote, I don't think you can be a bigot and be lovable. I don't think you can be a black baiter and lovable, nor an anti-Semite and lovable. And don't think the millions who watch this show should be conned into thinking that you can be. And there you have the basis for my peculiar complaint. There's nowhere near enough bigotry in All in the Family. Not by a long sight. How about showing the real thing for a while before accepting any more praise for honest shows and honest laughter? Norman Lear decided to pen a response with an article in the New York Times a few weeks later. His was entitled, As I Read How Laura Saw Archie. He wrote, The important thing about bigots and their choice of expression, however, is that unless they are conversing with other known bigots, they will always tread very carefully, testing before coming out directly. Archie Bunker does that, a bigot motivated not by hate, but by fear. Fear of change, fear of anything he doesn't understand. He knows that Mike and Gloria will jump his every bigoted remark, which indeed they do, so he tries forever to sneak them by. In 71 years, was there no one person you absolutely adored, someone you thought lovable, who one day shocked and surprised you with a flash of prejudice you never guessed was there? This dynamic would shape much of the discussion around All in the Family in the many years and decades to follow. What the impact is from an openly bigoted character who is meant to be, at least in part, a sympathetic figure to the audience. The two answers provided by Hobson and Lear would be the first two of many more to come. You know you are totally incomprehensible. Maybe so, but I make a lot of sense. <laughs> One of the most prominent recurring conflicts in All in the Family is the generational divide between Archie and Michael. Archie is old and on the right, while Michael is young and on the left. The best early example of this sharp divide in their attitudes is perhaps best seen in the series' second episode, Writing the President. And a crisis in the city. Must have had a hundred stars. The war in Vietnam. Sing out, sweet land. It was all about what's good with America. It's all about John Wayne. Well, John Wayne is, is what's good, good with America. America. Archie is someone who is capable of showing respect, but he reserves it for the classical symbols of America. The President, John Wayne, and the Flag. Michael takes a different approach. While he also loves his country, he sees the flaws of his country as an opportunity for growth and change. With Archie firmly rooted in the past and Michael moving into the future, many of the conflicts of the series arise from that tension. One of the ironies of this relationship is that Archie and Michael are actually very similar in some ways, particularly in their stubbornness and their tendency to be self-serving. In the episode Everybody Tells the Truth, we get a Rashomon-style retelling of a story where two repairmen came to fix the refrigerator at the bunker home. Michael's and Archie's versions are dramatically different. What are you doing eating an apple and working time? Oh, Mr. Bunker, we ain't had a meal break all day. Oh, having a little snack for yourself, huh? Yeah, I'm having a little snack. And uh, you don't mind if I have a little snack there, do you, Bunker? <laughs> The two argue back and forth about which version is accurate, but ultimately it's Edith's version of events that is closest to the truth. 
You want a piece of my apple, Mr. Bunker? No, I hate apple pieces. And don't be waving that shiv around there, will you? That's dangerous. What? This little thing? <laughs> Although Edith's version reveals a flaw in Archie's, Gloria is quick to point out how Michael got his story wrong, too. You said that there was no knife. Did I say that? Yeah, that's what you said. Yeah, you did. You're as bad as Daddy. You're as bad as me. <laughs> wait a second, wait a second. All right, so I got the knives mixed up, but the way you talk about it, it was a machete. Michael's defense here is important. He immediately pivots to pointing out Archie is worse. It reveals Michael's hypocrisy and tendency to avoid self-reflection. Although Archie is a very clear and obvious critique of a conservative loudmouth, Michael is also a critique of an empty-headed liberal but the show is a bit more sophisticated than trying to present both sides of the political spectrum as flawed. And as we learn more about the relationship between Archie and Michael, we see a much more complicated dynamic at work. In the episode, The Game's Bunkers Play, Michael's thin skin is on full display when Lionel points out that sometimes he's bothered by the way he's treated by Michael. In this episode, they're playing a board game where people share their feelings. What's the first thing you say whenever I see you? Always something about the black problem, right? Well, what do you want me to talk about, the weather? Well, sometimes, yeah. I mean, black people have weather too, you know? When Michael's intolerance is brought up, he's quick to deflect back to Archie. Just remember, Lionel, he is the one that doesn't want blacks in this neighborhood. I'm not the bigot in this house, he is. Yeah, but he doesn't know any better. Throughout this episode, Michael is sitting on Archie's chair, which is a telling detail. The two characters, aside from their politics, have very similar personalities. They're both thin-skinned, utterly convinced that they're right, and will go to war with anyone who says otherwise. Michael, feeling more at home in the current world, has the luxury of not being outraged by the changes he sees, and doesn't lash out as much as Archie. As Michael gets increasingly angry at the game, and everyone else playing it, Edith takes him aside to help him understand why he and Archie yell at each other. Archie had to quit school to support his family. He ain't never gonna be nothing more than he is right now. But you, you got a chance to be anything you want to be. That's why Archie's jealous of you. He sees in you all the things that he could never be. The episode ends with Michael giving Archie a hug. Though in later episodes, we would see them go back to yelling at one another. What this episode importantly reveals is how Michael is capable of learning and growing, and it's that quality that Archie is sorely missing. Michael is a critic because he sees the opportunity for a better world. Archie isn't because he doesn't want to see how that world failed him. Archie is consistently shown to be in the wrong far more often than Michael. But it's important to acknowledge that the show is also critiquing Michael as someone too comfortable in defending himself as simply not being Archie. Michael is already better than Archie, and would be better served striving to be better than himself. There's always room to learn, grow, and improve. One of the more tragic elements of Archie's character is how he's given the chance to better himself, but simply isn't capable of learning from his mistakes. Such as in the episode Archie and the editorial where he makes a stand against gun control. He's a fairy like all them gun control guys. <laughs> I'm for gun control. Tell it to her, maybe she'll get the marriage and know. When he's given a guest spot on a TV news program, Archie starts pushing conspiracy theories. You take your big international bankers, uh, they want to, what do you call, uh, masticate the people of this year nation like puppets on a wing. And then when they get that done, train us over to the commie. The end of the episode sees Archie being robbed at gunpoint, and the whole experience ends with him not learning a thing about guns. I reach for my wallet, I pull out a pistol, and I give it to him. <laughs> You too? Uh, yeah, and then you'd both be dead. I don't care! At least I'd have more money than I got now! <laughs> Regardless of your opinion on gun control, Archie is very clearly meant to be shown as foolish in this episode. His beliefs are rooted in nonsense, and he's incapable of presenting his ideas in a way that's thoughtful or even coherent. It suggests he's incapable of learning, or perhaps more accurately, he learns very slowly. As the series progresses, we see small changes in Archie as he becomes a little less rigid and a little more understanding. Bit by bit, he's becoming a more tolerant person, and we get a sense that some of that gruff exterior is more of a habit than an indelible trait. In spite of his tendency to rage against them, the new ideas represented by Michael and Gloria are a positive influence on Archie. While Edith tends to be the greater beneficiary of them throughout the series, as she's a much more open person in general, Archie slowly shifts with the times as the series progresses. You people involved, Lionel, with that women's liberation? Uh, no, not too much. You see, we're still working on plain old liberation. Archie's bigotry and the presence of race in the series is one of the most talked about aspects of the show. 
Although it was so much more than its racial commentary, that part in particular echoed very loudly in the discourse surrounding it. An important starting point here is to acknowledge that All in the Family's discussion about race in America is from the perspective of white people in the 1970s. That is, its characters and situations firmly place Archie, Edith, Michael, and Gloria as the focal point. One of the rules of the series was to ensure that when we saw racism and bigotry, typically coming from Archie, it had to be pushed back against. We never let him get away with just saying something. We'd always have one of the characters pushing back and pushing back hard against him. For the first episode, we met Lionel as a character who not only shows the audience Archie's ignorance, but he also serves as a counter to the negative stereotypes about black people that might be present in the minds of white viewers in the 1970s. The show would constantly challenge those assumptions in many of its episodes. You don't want to go blaming the whole police department for a couple of rotten apples. Oh, so, so what you're saying is don't condemn a whole group of people for the actions of a few. <laughs> That's right, Lionel. You got to remember that. Oh, I will. I will, Mr. <laughs> Lionel was originally played by Dorifel Martin in the first two ABC pilots, though he would be recast in the CBS version of the show. Originally, Norman Lear wanted Cleavon Little to play the character, an actor best known for going on to play Sheriff Bart in Blazing Saddles. But All in the Family director John Rich convinced him to keep looking until they eventually settled on Mike Evans. He's got to be young and he's got to be uh, neutral in a sense. So he, he, he's got to be able to tease Archie. Uh, in a way that, that is not offensive. Because white America is going to be looking at this kid. Like, we're saying enough that's strange. Though the intentions may have been good by the creators of All in the Family, they were still conscious of a show that was trying not to scare white people with its depiction of black characters. For 1971, this was considered ahead of the curve compared to other programs that wouldn't even consider a recurring black character who regularly embarrassed the white lead. Lionel would, on occasion, do more than coyly smile behind Archie's back, though. In the season 3 episode, Lionel steps out. Lionel takes out Archie's niece, Linda, to go dancing. Archie then confronts Lionel about it. I'm very disappointed in you, Lionel. <laughs> <coughs> I thought you was one of the good ones. <laughs> that little eyebrow raise speaks volumes. But this was not an episode where Lionel would be eliminating himself to simply raising an eyebrow. Now, we've been friends, and we can go on being friends. But when it comes to black and white and all the other wonderful thoughts you have in between, put a lid on that, Archie. Another thing I liked about this episode is that it revealed Archie's struggles to change in this new world isn't something endemic to him as just being an old guy. People who are similar to him, like his brother, are capable of change. He's changed. He ain't changed! He was eight years old. He always wanted to be like me, and he was like me, and he's still like me. He's not like you. He doesn't care what color a person's skin is. Early in the series, Lionel is joined by more members of his family in the episode titled Lionel Moves Into the Neighborhood. Lionel's mother, Louise Jefferson, is played by Isabel Sanford, and his uncle Henry is played by Mel Stewart. The episode focuses on Archie trying to keep a black family out of his neighborhood with a petition, a plotline that absolutely would not work in the present day. The episode does give us some very sharp satire, like this line from Edith. Two years ago, there was nothing but servants and janitors. Now they're teachers and doctors and lawyers. They've come a long way on TV. <laughs> There's a level of awareness here you don't typically see in television shows more anxious to pat themselves on the back for including some diverse faces. Representation is nice, but can't take the place of real racial justice. Another thing to keep in mind when discussing race in this or any other television show. Archie is more conflicted when he finds out Lionel's family is the one moving in, though he still isn't thrilled about it. We see Archie dealing with his new neighbors, the Jeffersons, a few episodes later in The First and Last Supper. In the episode, Archie and Edith are invited over to the Jeffersons' place for dinner, and we find out that Lionel's father, George Jefferson, who we haven't seen up to this point, is just as uninterested in sharing a table with Archie. Well, he's kind of old-fashioned, you know. Says he just doesn't want to sit down with Whitey. <laughs> George Jefferson wouldn't appear on the series for another two years, and according to Norman Lear, it was because they were struggling to find the right actor for the role. On the other hand, Isabel Sanford was cast very early on to play the part of Louise. Although Sanford had originally auditioned for the part of Louise's sister, her performance was so strong that she was given the main role, and she was able to infuse the character with a bit of her own voice. Black women don't do that. Uh, and I wouldn't go running in the kitchen to get him his beer or whatever he wants. Norman Lear was quoted as saying, 
From the first time I saw Isabel in that scene with Jean and Carol, offstage in rehearsal, it was magic. I knew there had to be an important relationship there. The Jeffersons, becoming an increasingly large part of the show, brought with it opportunities to discuss more issues regarding racial integration and its impact on white America. In season two's The Blockbuster, we meet a realtor taking advantage of the changing demographics of the neighborhood to make money, offering the bunkers $35,000 for their home, which at the time was a pretty good price. Archie, don't you see? He buys low from whites that are frightened, and then he takes advantage of his own people by selling to them for two or three times what a house is worth. The concept of white flight, where white people were fleeing their city neighborhoods to live in the suburbs, and the profiteers who exploited that, is the sort of story you wouldn't often see in sitcoms back then, and it demonstrates how racism has a direct material impact on everyday people, since this whole scam would immediately fall apart if white people could put aside their prejudice and live next to black people. In season four, in the episode Henry's Farewell, we finally meet George Jefferson, played by Sherman Hemsley, preceded, naturally, by his voice. Archie, why don't you toast Henry now? All right, I will. Hey, you know, ain't nobody making no toast to my brother but me. Who the hell is that? That's Bob. I thought it was a nice toast. I'm just sorry it had to take place in a honky house. <laughs> Of all the recurring characters on All in the Family, George Jefferson is arguably the most memorable, though the role originally wasn't going to be Hemsley's. According to John Rich, who was a producer on the show at this point, Norman Lear originally wanted someone else for the role. And I said, Avon Long, the dancer? He said, yeah. I said, I saw him play Sportin' Life in Porgy and Bess in something like 1940, 41. Sherman Hemsley was discovered in a stage production of a show called Pearly though it was years later when he would be brought up for the role of George Jefferson. It just so happens that they were casting for uh, the, the role of the George Jefferson character, and uh, it went all in the family, and uh, they had been looking for me. Although Archie and Henry Jefferson had had fights, his fights with George Jefferson were even more intense, and it let us look deeper into the Jefferson family as characters. In the episode titled Lionel's Engagement, we meet Lionel's fiancée, Jenny, played by Lynn Moody. What made Jenny particularly interesting was that her parents were an interracial couple, played by Kim Hamilton and Charles Aidman. You white! And you're black. You're kicking her head, in. Louise and Mr. Willis end up diffusing the situation in a very classy way. This is Jefferson. Yes. May I have this dance? You certainly may. Louise! Interracial couples had been seen on television sitcoms before, one famous example being Lucy and Ricky Ricardo, but they certainly weren't the norm, and there was always backlash to portraying these types of pairings. More than just being part of the story, All in the Family also had a different approach to how its black characters were written. Lynn Moody, who played Jenny in Lionel's engagement, reflects on being an actress during that time, saying, I went on one audition for a commercial and noticed that there were separate audition sides for a white version and a black version. In the white version, they spoke English. Oh, mother, don't do that. In the black version, it was, dig me, that ain't hip. I'll never forget that line. That's why reading a script for a Norman Lear show was such a treat, because all the characters just spoke like people. Another incredibly impactful episode that discussed the issue of race was Sammy's Visit in Season 2, featuring a guest appearance by Sammy Davis Jr. Davis, there he is! I told you he was coming! There he is right out there on the stoop! Come on in, Mr. Davis, come on! Highly unrealistic, and the only major celebrity cameo the show would ever have, this particular episode bent over backwards with its premise to get Sammy Davis on. It was explained that Archie found his briefcase after picking him up in the part-time cab Archie drove once a week. This created the pretext to get Sammy Davis to the bunker house and have him be in an episode. Unlike most black guests to his home, Archie is very accommodating to Sammy Davis Jr., although he still doesn't feel comfortable sharing a glass with him. And to friendship. Ah, uh, you uh, hear that? that, that nice. To friendship, <laughs> drinking up myself. Yeah. <laughs> and Sammy has some fun. If you were prejudiced, you'd walk around thinking that you're better than anybody else in the world. But I can honestly say, having spent these marvelous moments with you, you ain't better than anybody. <laughs> The episode's most iconic moment is undoubtedly when Archie takes a picture with Sammy and it takes a little turn at the end. One, two, three. <laughs> that kiss would be replayed many times over and is arguably the most famous single moment from the series. While much of that had to do with Sammy Davis Jr. doing the kissing, it's also because the man he was kissing, Archie Bunker, was such a famous bigot. 
It's the sort of thing you would never see on television, yet all in the family dared to go there. Aside from that one moment, the episode did a good job providing some commentary on how race intersects with the celebrity culture of America, so much so that Archie even takes the kiss in stride, and proudly shows off the signed photo he gets where Sammy Davis writes, To Archie Bunker, the whitest guy I know. <laughs> In the real world, Sammy Davis Jr. had been a big fan of All in the Family and had supposedly been trying to get on the show for a while. Donna McCrohan recounts the episode in her book, writing, Lear's initial reaction to writing a role for Davis was negative, only because a big-name performer would skew the emphasis of the program, like having Bob Hope play a plumber or Lucille Ball a nurse. We worked for months and finally came up with a story by Bill Dana that could include Sammy and still be realistic, Lear announced in January 1972. However, Sammy's appearance will by no means set a new precedent for future shows. He's our first and last big star, and he was fantastic. Said Davis, When Norman called and said I could do the show, I was so excited I was speechless. As the day drew near to report for rehearsals, I got more excited and nervous. I was up at 7am for an 11am call. My wife thought I was ill. I'm a late sleeper and not known for being prompt, but on this special occasion I was 50 minutes early. It was a thrill which can only be compared to my first big break in show business. Not every attempt at racial humor in All in the Family worked well, and some of it drifted into what a modern audience, and perhaps an audience at the time, would consider racist. In the two-parter Birth of the Baby, which was about Michael and Gloria having their first child, Joey, there's a subplot involving Archie being pressured into a stage performance by the guys at his lodge, which was a social club he was a part of. This stage performance happens to be a minstrel show. Archie resists being in the show, which does lead to a funny moment. Now this is a bad thing we're doing. That ain't nice there, dressing up like that and making fun of the colored people. No, Archie Bunker ain't gonna do that. He ain't gonna get up on the stage and make fun of people that he liked and admired all his life. <laughs> But eventually, Archie gives in and agrees to take part in the show, and so we get a lot of scream time of Archie in blackface. There is even a particularly bad joke where, when Archie goes to the hospital, still in blackface, he accidentally goes into the wrong room, and a woman panics, fearing she's about to be raped by a black man. While I can't speak for an audience in 1975, I can imagine a modern audience wincing more than laughing at this two-parter and its tone-deaf racial humor. I should mention Carol O'Connor resisted the idea of wearing blackface. Archie's uh, Lodge uh, put on a show in blackface. I said, I don't think that's funny. We tried to make it a satire on people who do that sort of thing. I don't know if we made it that time. It fell short, probably. Archie's flirtation with bigotry did, at least sometimes, bring to light the show's need to moderate him. In the two-parter, Archie and the KKK, we see Archie join the Queen's Council of Crusaders. The joke is, of course, that Archie just thinks they're a regular bunch of guys and has no idea just how racist they actually are. Until they make a wardrobe change. Archie has to then reckon with the fact that his ideas aren't too far off from this group's. You got up there and you said, if we could show you a way to turn that guy around and make him into a law-abiding, patriotic American citizen, that you would do anything we wanted. That was beautiful, Archie. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. What these lines reveal is that white supremacy is about more than hating a particular group, but rather creating a uniformity of thought among white people under the banners of a patriotic nationalism. The show isn't going quite so far as to say America is white supremacist, but rather that American patriotism is often claimed by white supremacists. When Archer reveals to Michael and Gloria the mistake he's made, and that the clan is planning to burn a cross in front of their house, they're shocked. I can't believe you didn't know what you were getting into. You couldn't possibly be that stupid. That, that's what you think. <laughs> the reaction from Michael and Gloria is so extreme, they demand Archie leave their home. And they won't even let Archie see his grandson. I don't yeah. want him with you. He, he wants to be with me. Well, I don't want him with you. You know, your grandfather wears sheets. <laughs> Archie eventually confronts the clan and gets them to call off the cross burning, showing us that he's not a complete monster. To see Archie go this far to nearly falling in with the worst of the worst provides a hard backstop as to just how bigoted this guy can get, 
and reminds us of how Archie's type of bigotry can very easily end up in a darker place. There's one line in particular that's especially chilling in this episode. And I could go to the proper authorities. They'd only laugh at you. What if I wore a better suit? <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is there's a whole lot of us, Bunker. Now, the idea of a racist cop isn't that shocking, but what this should serve as more broadly is how pervasive these white supremacists are. The two-party reveals them to be members of the community, hiding who they are as they slowly build their ranks, using camouflage words such as patriotism and American values to hide their goals. The presumption that these groups are a thing of the past is part of the cover, and while it would be nice to say that this is a relic of the 1970s, it's still an issue that exists in the present day. Racism doesn't just rear its head coming from bigots like Archie, though. As I mentioned earlier, we can see examples of that in Michael, such as when Lionel calls him out for treating him differently. Just once, I'd like for you to talk to me like I was Lionel Jefferson and not a representative of the whole black race. There's an even better example in the episode, Mike's Move, where he finds out he's up against another candidate who happens to be black. And Michael worries about affirmative action. It's not fair for guys like John Caston to get an even break. <laughs> Why shouldn't I get an even break? I mean, why should it be held against me just because he was lucky enough to be born black? <laughs> Mike talks about it with his friend that's also up for the job, John, played by David Downing. If you got this job and you knew that the main reason was because you were black, how would you feel? Beautiful. <laughs> Did any white man ever turn down a job knowing that the main reason he got it was because he was white? What makes this episode an interesting break from all the ones showing us Archie's bigotry is that it reveals the white characters on the show are very much limited by their experience. And Michael feeling for the first time like the system wasn't fair to him reflects what John has felt throughout his entire life. John provided a nice counterpoint to the prevailing white experience that's often centered in All in the Family. But it might be interesting to actually see what contemporary viewers of that time who happened to be black felt about the show as well. More prominent critics included Bill Cosby, who spoke out against the show, comparing Archie Bunker to a junkie shooting up, something that was neither funny nor fun to watch. On the other hand, Flip Wilson was quoted as saying, I like it because it's different. It's a pioneer show that opened the door for Sanford and Son and other series. Sure, I'm sorry the subject has to be prejudices, but they do exist, and I look at the program from the standpoint of a comedian and artist. Archie Bunker proved such a prominent figure that he was featured on the cover of Ebony magazine, and on the inside there was an editorial by Charles L. Sanders where he details how Archie Bunker is saying things and projecting attitudes that stir up anti-black passions and trigger all kind of racial wickedness. Readers responded to this editorial in a number of ways. Some said that the show's use of slurs was dangerous. As one reader wrote, These words are weapons, and Archie throws daggers every Saturday night. Another wrote, I share your feelings that All in the Family reinforces bigotry and racism rather than making it lovable and laughable. But from another we got, the show is definitely beneficial to anyone who watches it. However, one has to have a sense of humor. In her book, Von Hodenberg notes that in 1973, All in the Family was the third most popular show among black audiences, behind Sanford and Son and Flip Wilson. While certainly not quite as popular as it was with white audiences, it did reveal that there were a number of black Americans who chose to tune in every night. Von Hodenberg also goes into detail about how, while it may have been popular with people looking at the screen, those working behind the scenes were typically not black. She writes, Almost all scriptwriters were white Jewish men in their late 40s or older, mostly from the East Coast and lower middle class origins, and there were virtually no African American writers, despite Lear's efforts to recruit some. Upon closer examination, we find that the program gave little airtime to black performers, and rarely commented directly on race policies. Rather, its approach was to explore the racist attitudes lingering in the white working classes, and to do so by caricaturing a bigoted hard hat. The actor himself, Mike Evans, thought his character had an unbelievability about him because he can put up with all the stuff Lionel takes. All in the Family benefits greatly from being a show that discussed race in a way no other show was trying to do at the time, it also reveals how just making the attempt, especially in a time when that wasn't expected, does bring with it some goodwill. In 1972, the Los Angeles chapter of the NAACP gave the show an image award. Race wasn't solely discussed through how white Americans interacted with black ones. Hispanic characters also appeared in the series, albeit less frequently. We see one example in season 4's We're Having a Heat Wave, where Archie and Henry Jefferson team up to keep a Puerto Rican couple out of the neighborhood. Well, Bucker, we're off the hook. Braddock sold the house and the Puerto Ricans are out of it! Hey, that's great news! We wouldn't see her recurring Hispanic character in All in the Family until the arrival of Teresa Betancourt, played by Liz Torres, in Season 7. 
She first appeared in the episode Archie's Operation, but would be seen again in the episode Teresa Moves In, where she would take a room in the bunker home that had been left empty once Gloria and Michael had moved out. Don't worry about Archie. His bark is worse than his bite. I don't worry about his bark, but one bite and I bite him back. <laughs> Todd has got the chance to be on the series after meeting Carol O'Connor on an episode of The Tonight Show. She described the experience of being cast, saying, The All in the Family producers were already thinking about Archie adopting a little girl, but Carol decided he wanted me because I was funny. Carol convinced Norman to use me on one show. Norman Lear would say he had seen Torres earlier on stage and thought she was great, so it's possible he didn't need much convincing. Any Spanish-speaking people might have noticed Betancourt isn't a very Hispanic name. Although it has French origins, it was used because O'Connor had a former colleague who was a Hispanic woman who had that name. Teresa would only be on the show for a couple of episodes, not appearing at all after the seventh season, and it reflects how All in the Family was very limited in its racial commentary. One of the few examples of a recurring character who was a racial minority who wasn't black was Clyde Kusatsu playing Reverend Chong, much to Archie's shock. This wasn't much more than a passing reference to his bigotry, though it was pretty cool to see a Chinese priest who just existed in the world and the only controversy existed in Archie's mind. We really only get a sense of Archie's vast number of prejudices when he would drop a few slurs and move on, and it really reveals how limited some of this racial commentary truly was. Of course, I should also mention that Archie's bigotry would also target people who would more commonly be considered white in the present day, such as Italians, the Irish, and the Polish. In these cases, it does seem to hit a bit differently. For example, while Archie may throw anti-Polish slurs at Michael, he also calls him a lazy white man. There's a certain kind of hierarchy to Archie's racism, and one the show oddly reflects as the characters furthest away from Archie are the ones who get the most scorn, and are typically the ones we see the least. We are Americans equal to you. Equal to me? You ain't even equal to him. <laughs> Jim Cullen wrote of Archie's racism, In our time, working class people are sometimes depicted as bigoted because they're afraid of losing their relative sense of privilege what W.E.B. Du Bois famously called the psychological wage of whiteness, a form of cultural currency Archie is all too willing to pocket. Archie's dissatisfaction with the world is based on the assumption that what belongs to him is being taken by non-white peoples, but really it just reflects a loss of privilege, a form of privilege that used racism to justify an unjust hierarchy built on slavery and colonialism. This type of prejudice is something Archie inherited from his father, as revealed in the episode Two's a Crowd. In it, Archie and Mike are trapped in a storeroom with nothing to do but drink and talk, and so we slowly learn about Archie's past. My old man used to call people the same things as your old man, but I always knew he was wrong. So was your old man. No, he was. Yes, he was. He your wasn't. father was wrong. Sam! Your father was wrong! Your father? That's the man that comes home, bringing you candy. Father is the first guy to throw a baseball to you and take you for walks in the park, holding you by the hand. He busted that hand once, and he busted her on me <laughs> to teach me to do good. <laughs> my father, he shoved me in a closet for seven hours, teach me to do good. Cause he loved me, he loved me. You're supposed to love your father. Cause your father loves you. But how can any man that loves you tell you anything that's wrong? Archie is living with the consequences of his father's actions, and he has to reconcile with the fact that he truly believed his father loved him. Who wouldn't want to have unquestioning confidence in a parent's love? But if that parent is abusive, that question needs to be asked. That assumption of love is worth the pain for Archie, so he avoids it. Symbolically, Archie's father can be understood as the patriarchal world Archie was born into, the promise made to him as a boy of living the American dream if he just did his duty, fought in World War II, and worked a decent job for the rest of his life. Everything would turn out okay. And as he looks around at his life, instead of questioning the dream that he was sold, he's given the convenient scapegoat of blaming people who look different to distract him from how society has failed him. This episode humanized Archie perhaps more than any other one when it came to discussing his bigotry, 
It presents him not just as a purveyor of hate, but also the victim. Bigotry has poisoned his mind. I think I know what's the matter. It's the change. You mean spring is coming? Edith Bunker is a challenging character to summarize. Though never portrayed as particularly intellectual, she has a deep understanding of the people in her life. And though her husband is an absolute bore, she seems to offset him by being a delight to everyone she meets. If Archie is understood as a man who is incapable of learning, or at least not being particularly good at it, Edith is the opposite. Throughout the series, we see her embrace the changing world around her, and gradually she reflects the evolving spirit of the fight for gender equality. When we first meet Edith, she's most often seen catering to Archie's whims, making his dinner, getting him a beer, and generally letting him have his way. But we can see brief glimpses of her independence in episodes such as Edith Has Jury Duty, where she refuses to reveal the details of the case she's on to Archie. Till death was part, for better, for worse, in secrets and in health. <laughs> oh, sorry. Edith shows she can stand up to more than Archie when she holds up the trial, eventually keeping an innocent man out of jail. And Mrs. Bunker was proven right at the 11th hour when a taxi driver, Norton Rogers, broke down today and confessed to the crime. You were right! We you were right! Edith's situation shouldn't really be understood as ever quite being dominated by Archie, as we see in the episode Archie and Edith Alone. She reveals that much of his dominance in the home comes from her allowing him to have it, something revealed when they play cards. I thought it would make you feel better if I let you win. What? Edith walks the fine line of standing up to Archie while ensuring his ego isn't crushed. While it would be much easier to simply submit to his every want and need, Edith has desires of her own. We see that more clearly as the series progresses, and Edith starts living outside of the home more often, such as in season 6's Edith Breaks Out. In the episode, Edith volunteers at the Sunshine Home against Archie's wishes and impresses them. They like my work so much that starting tomorrow, they're gonna pay me two dollars an hour. Edith's growth is a gradual process, but it shouldn't be mistaken as mapping directly to the changes seen in the women's liberation movement of the day. Rather, Edith reflected the movement's more conservative element, and a kind of hope that a movement that reflects change being embraced by a new generation of women isn't entirely out of reach for an older woman like Edith and it demonstrates the breadth of a movement that should attempt to meet women where they are and showing them how to improve instead of telling them where they're expected to be. Jane Stapleton reflected on this saying, I couldn't be more thrilled with the effects of women's lib. All that consciousness raising, but we can't hide the kind of woman who is restricted by her domestic life. She exists, and I think that by showing Edith as she really is, we are doing more good than an instant out-of-character liberationist would accomplish. There's a slow development going on with Edith, and that's the way it's really going to happen in this country. As the show progressed, Jean Stapleton became increasingly involved in women's rights movements, and she credits her experience on All in the Family with broadening her horizons. Behind the scenes, she was also a champion for getting more women on the writing staff, though that environment was not always welcoming. Pat Shea, one of the writers on the show, reflected on her time there in an interview saying, There were two old-time male writers on the show. One of them really thought women can't be comedy writers. They can be actresses and they can be comedians, but they really can't be comedy writers. And his wife is the one who told me that's what he would say. But in that last year of All in the Family, Harriet Weiss and I wrote quite a few of the scripts. We really loved working on that show. It was so much fun. Gloria would be the natural counterpoint to Edith, or perhaps more accurately, a different vision of an empowered woman. Though more often than not, her presence tended to be more muted in the earlier seasons. John Rich remarked on Gloria, It's been easy to underwrite her, to let her serve as a feeder of lines. We received letters from a women's lib group asking, What does she do? What's her job? Her education? Is she just around all the time? Norman Lear showed me a letter signed by about 50 women in bold signatures and said, What do you think? I said, I have to agree. We have somewhat ignored Gloria. I think we should write stories that give her another function than being another ear on the set. Sally Struthers remarked about that time, I often had only three lines. I'll help you set the table, Mom. Michael, where are you going? And, oh, Daddy, stop it. But every once in a while, there was something to sink my teeth into. Even in episodes such as Gloria Has a Bellyful, which involves Gloria becoming pregnant and having a miscarriage, it was arguably just as focused on her relationship with Archie and giving us the opportunity to see him in a new light. You love me. I 
I love you too, Daddy. While it's absolutely fearless for a show to have an episode about a miscarriage only a few weeks into its run, and this scene in particular is quite moving, it's also clearly centered on Archie's feelings for Gloria. And over time, the character certainly did have more to do, but more often than not, she served as the person who introduced a feminist idea, rather than having stories built around her exploring those ideas herself. Gloria really seemed to shine when she was contrasted with Michael, particularly when we see her butt up against the limits of his own brand of feminism. In Mike's appendix, we see Michael wary of going to a female surgeon. You're prejudiced against a woman surgeon! We also see Michael uncomfortable when Gloria is the one who initiates sex. When it comes to women, you're still working on the old double standard. If a man comes on strong, he's a great lover, a Casanova! But if it's a woman, she's an nymphomaniac. And the root of Michael's condescension towards Gloria is explored in the episode, Mike's Friends. Albert Einstein loved his wife, and she was a very simple woman. <laughs> his sexism demonstrates the blind spots in his liberal worldview. Even though Michael is increasingly becoming an educated and sophisticated person, he consistently shows areas he needs to improve upon, specifically when it comes to experiences that are unlike his own. In these episodes where Gloria runs into Michael's obstinance, we get a much better sense of her own journey and the challenges she faces to be taken more seriously, such as her desire to better herself intellectually and dealing with feelings of inadequacy because her husband got an education while she was working to support them. The conflicts between Gloria and Michael are just one of the dichotomies between characters that the series provides us to give us a more rounded look at a particular issue, not just seeing two sides fight it out, but for both sides to be ones that are sympathetic to the audience. It gave some emotional weight to the arguments, forcing the viewers to confront them being made earnestly by a loved one rather than intellectually discarded because it was coming out of the mouth of a nameless other. One limit of this approach, though, was how it sometimes focused a bit too much on individual rather than systemic critiques. Archie and Michael are agents of sexism when they look down on Edith and Gloria. Sexism is often presented as something more ingrained into individuals. That certainly isn't always the case, and there are several episodes that explore the systemic roots of it. But as the series progressed, those systemic explanations typically fell away to more personal stories. There are two episodes that contrast those different approaches that touched on a particularly sensitive topic centering around Gloria and then Edith. I have to stop here to offer a content warning. This section is going to include some very graphic discussion and depiction of sexual assault. Even though this is a sitcom that is known for handling some very heavy issues, I really want to stress that these episodes in particular get very intense. So if that's a difficult subject for you, skip ahead to the next section of the video. In season three, we got the episode Gloria the Victim, in which Gloria is the victim of an attempted rape. I thought I'd save myself a few steps, and then it happened. It happened Gloria, so fast. did I tell you Mabel Hefner bought a new sofa? <laughs> it happened yeah, so, so fast, awkward. I didn't know. We find out later that Gloria fainted during the experience, which she believes scared the guy into running off. But regardless, it was a deeply traumatic experience for her. As the episode progresses, we see Gloria not wanting anyone, including the police, to know about what happened because she's too embarrassed to talk about it. I don't want to go to the police. I'm embarrassed to talk about it anymore. Archie calls the police anyway, and a police officer visits to question Gloria. The cop then proceeds to demonstrate what it would be like for Gloria to testify in court. Well, what were you wearing? Tight sweater? No. Mini skirt? Well, it was short, but it's not a mini. Oh, you get a kick out of guys wishing at you in the street, huh? No. You do. You enjoy egging them on, don't you? No. Like today? No. Yes, you do. No. When Gloria rushes off to the kitchen to get away from the hostile questioning, Edith tells Gloria something similar happened to her, too, though it ended with her kneeing the guy in the crotch. Because in my time, we was too scared to talk open. But what I'm saying is maybe we should have. Because over the years, I've often wondered how many other girls that man got under the boardwalk. And how many didn't get away. Although Gloria is resolved to do what she has to to help the police catch this guy, Michael and Archie send the cop away because they don't want Gloria to testify. Take care of your own. That's the rule. That's what we done here today. We took care of our own. What this episode demonstrates so well is how not only do the men in Gloria's life fail her, but the system does as well. A system supposedly set up for justice can only achieve it by traumatizing Gloria all over again, by putting her on the witness stand and implying that she was asking for it. 
it was a very well-rounded episode in that respect, showing us both interpersonal and systemic factors that contribute to Gloria being a victim and not being able to have any sort of justice. As the episode closes, the camera hauntingly lingers on Gloria's face as we hear Archie's rant about supposedly taking care of one's own, and we can see how hollow those words are in Gloria's eyes. Sally Struthers reflected on how the events echoed something that happened to her in her life when she was held captive by a neighbor. She said, Just like Gloria, I didn't report my attacker to the police, and he really should have been arrested, and there's so much regret in that. I was so ashamed that I had been lured into his apartment. Reflecting on this episode, Norman Lear said in 2022, In the writer's room, there was a lot of discussion about how this episode would end, and whether or not Gloria would report the attack. But thinking about this again, I wonder if I would still end it the same way if I had done this episode last week. In my mind, I'm thinking maybe not. This topic would be revisited even more intensely in Season 8's Edith's 50th Birthday. This time, Edith would be the target, and, more disturbingly, it would all unfold in front of the camera as a man posing as a police detective corners Edith in her own home. Seems there's a man in your neighborhood who's been, well, he's been molesting women. He's a man about uh, my height and build, wears a gray suit, dark hat, and a uh, blue and gold striped tie. What follows is nearly 10 minutes of Edith stalling, fighting, and doing anything in her power to stop the rapist. It's incredibly dark and difficult to watch, especially for a sitcom. You can almost sense the audience desperate to laugh when the odd joke comes up. You ain't taking off your clothes, are you? <laughs> yeah. Then I'm gonna take yours off. Wouldn't you like a cup of coffee instead? <laughs> Watching this is a very strange experience. Something terrible is happening, but there's a desire for it to simply not be real, because it's too heartbreaking to think that anyone would do this to a sweet woman like Edith. When the cake Edith was making for her birthday begins to burn, they move to the kitchen and she manages to use it to escape in one of the most relieving moments of the series. That's also one of the biggest ovations the series ever got. The director of the episode, Paul Bogart, had filmed the episode without any stops to keep up the tension, but he was forced to stop at this moment because of how strong the reaction from the audience was. And that was how the episode ended, with Edith running into Archie's arms, just barely having gotten away. In her book, Donna McCrohan describes how this idea was originally developed for another Norman Lear series, One Day at a Time, where Anne Romano, played by Bonnie Franklin, would have been the target but it was thought that the message would have more impact had the target been an older woman, so it was moved over to All in the Family. During the reading of the script, the performers were unhappy with the episode, and Jean Stapleton in particular felt uncomfortable. Norman there reached out to Gail Abarbanal from the Santa Monica Rape Treatment Center, who advised him that one of the real difficulties with surviving a rape or attempted rape was dealing with the lasting trauma, and she suggested another episode to explore the topic. Abarbanal was quoted saying, Norman presented an incredible opportunity. He said, If you could talk to 40 million people about rape, what would you want to say? I suggested that they focus on both the victim and her family and how important it is for victims to have support from their significant others. The second part of this two-parter is also very difficult to watch. Edith was deeply hurt by the experience, and it's heartbreaking to watch her try to cope. <laughs> Looking back at this moment, I can't get over the note I wrote when I first watched it. I want to cry for Edith. And each time I watch it, I feel that way all over again. Gene Stapleton's performance cannot possibly be understated for either of these two episodes. Much like Gloria in Gloria the Victim, Edith also doesn't want to call the police. When the cops arrive, they tell the bunkers they have a suspect, but Edith is too traumatized to even speak with them. Can you identify these clothes, ma'am? <laughs> no! No, I can't! No! He'll kill me! He'll kill me! He'll kill me! He'll kill me! As the story goes on, we find out the guy who was arrested was let go, but when another woman is attacked, Gloria encourages Edith to face her fear, and it gets intense. You've got to help put away the sicko creep, because that way you can stop feeling so victimized and be in control of your life again, you know? And that'll help you stop being afraid. The mother I know would never refuse. My mother always helped other people. You know what? You are selfish. You're not my mother anymore. <laughs> 
Where are we gonna go, Edith? Down to the police station. Oh, no, Edith, you ain't gonna identify that guy, are you? Yeah, man? if it's him, I gotta stop him. These episodes are harrowing, maybe the most difficult ones to watch in the series. But not just for the attack, but seeing the lasting damage it did to Edith. It reveals how shame and fear prevent women from speaking out against their attackers. And when Edith decides to speak up, it's incredibly courageous. I don't think I even need to point out that Gene Stapleton won an Emmy for this performance. The two-parter did a stellar job demonstrating the traumatic impact of an assault and the importance of having a support system in place. In contrast to Gloria the Victim, Edith's story was more centered around individual actions being critiqued rather than also including a systemic critique, such as when the justice system is reflected in the police officer explaining how testifying will once again traumatize Gloria. Although perhaps this is putting too much on what is otherwise an incredibly moving piece of television, the fact that it was breaking new ground on such a powerful subject is still a huge step forward. David Dukes, the actor who portrayed the rapist, said in an interview, For the first and only time in my career, the audience growled. Deep, guttural stuff. I've played villains before, but I never had an audience growl and really hate. They despised me. I was at a cocktail party and a guy came up to me and said, I know you. You're the guy who raped Edith Bunker. I answered, uh, attempted rape. He went on, yeah, you're right, attempted. I saw the show in my class. It turned out he was a detective with the NYPD, and this, along with other films, is used to convey the woman's side of rape. Actually, a lot of crisis centers have used this episode since it first aired. All in the Family was a series that acknowledged feminism at first, but grew to really grapple with the issue as time went by, in part driven by the women in the audience who demanded it of the series. Von Hodenberg explains, all in the Family's agenda, favoring liberal, legal, self-help feminism at the expense of collective action and radical feminism, was set by elites but then pushed forward by the audiences themselves. Certainly liberal producers and feminist activists left an imprint on the series, but without the engaged letters written by hundreds of viewers, Edith and Gloria would not have grown over time. Producers and writers took these letters seriously because they came from the 18-49 to year old women who were the network's prime target group. Therefore, All in the Family did more than mirror or comment on the feminist movement, it was a major public forum in which changes to gender rules were negotiated and advanced. All in the Family was, in many ways, bringing the medium of television into the present. It was stepping into the conversation that people were already having and thrusting it into the mainstream. And that conversation is still going on today. You're saying that you enjoy the fact that the commercials insult your intelligence? Yes, I do. It's hard to explain just how popular All in the Family was in the 1970s because its level of success would be difficult to replicate today. Aside from its runaway ratings, All in the Family was a massive part of pop culture. An article in The New Yorker describes it. In 1971, the Saturday Review reported that teachers were requesting study guides to use the show to teach their students lessons about bigotry. The literary theorist, Paul DeMann, quoted Archie and Edith's dialogue to dramatize a point, appropriately enough, about the slipperiness of meaning, the idea that the intent of words was endlessly interpretable. A paperback called The Wit and Wisdom of Archie Bunker became a bestseller. In 1973, a poll found that Archie Bunker's was the most recognizable face in America, and for a while there was a craze for bumper stickers reading Archie Bunker for President. At the 1972 Democratic Convention in Miami, the character got a vote for vice president. And that was just for starters. There was an album that featured some of the funniest moments from the show, a cookbook of Edith's recipes, a pair of books by a pastor explaining the religious dimensions of the show, a board game, a card game, and an anatomically correct doll of Archie's grandson, Joey. But with all that success came more pressure mounting on the series and the people creating it, and some of the creative differences seen early on were starting to build behind the scenes. In 1974, during the show's fifth season, a series of episodes aired, starting with one titled, Where's Archie?, in which Carol O'Connor was noticeably absent. Archie's always on time. Dinner at 6, Cronkite at 7, bedtime at 10.30. Something's happened to him. This absence was the culmination of years of fighting between O'Connor and Lear over the series. O'Connor felt very strongly that he was the driving force behind Archie, and should have veto power over story ideas, lines, and sometimes entire scripts. I knew shortly into it that he would likely be unhappy with the script every time. McCrowan describes the dynamic. In O'Connor's case, the running gag had it that as soon as he saw a script, he hated it. 
finding at once what was wrong with it and insisting on changes. He's been known to refer to scripts as outlines. But he also instinctively knew how to slip inside Archie's character, and not just remark on the things Archie might say, but in fact to become and then speak as Archie. Carol O'Connor wasn't the only one who voiced his input on the scripts, and all cast members were noted as having made contributions at some point. Rob Reiner in particular was known for making frequent suggestions, and he even wrote a few of the episodes. That is, if any episode can be reduced to a single writer. One of the major dynamics on All in the Family was the collaborative nature of it. It was a running joke that the highest praise a script could get from Norman Lear was that it would rewrite really well. Herb Gardner watched this exchange of ideas and crosstalk and notes being passed back and forth and said, this is creative communism. Even with that collaborative spirit, O'Connor still stood apart as someone who was particularly passionate about his own vision of the character and the series. So here were all these Jewish writers. They're trying to write a script for a typical New York guy. Uh, uh, an arch guy by the name of Archie. They didn't know that character. But I knew the character. I sure was a white man, and I sure was a Christian, and I sure understood Christian bias. Dorman Lear credits O'Connor for his contributions to the character. That when he finally accepted it and slipped into the character, forget the gifted as an actor, he was so gifted as the writer of that character. O'Connor's absence in the fifth season was more than him being upset. He was suing for more money and greater creative control of the series. Ultimately, the dispute was settled when O'Connor's salary was increased to $28,000 an episode, which works out to roughly $176,000 in 2024. The three-parter written to explain Archie's absence was largely put together without a conclusion. Had O'Connor not returned, he would have been written off the show. James Cromwell, who was guest starring in one of those episodes, reflected on that time saying, In the third episode, where he was missing, we were going to hear that Archie was dead. Well, we were rehearsing that third show when Carol realized the error of his ways and decided to return. Archie's return in The Longest Kiss carries with it a genuine sense of relief, both in front of the camera and behind it. There would be some other rumblings over contracts backstage, such as Sally Struthers wanting out of hers to tackle other projects. An injunction was placed against Struthers from working elsewhere, and the New York Times reported that Norman Lear even had a replacement Gloria on standby. But luckily a compromise was reached, and Struthers was allowed to skip four episodes from the show's sixth season. Reflecting on this time, Rob Reiner expressed that he believed much of these disputes were not nearly as volatile as the press made them out to be, although O'Connor still seemed like a big enough problem that it led to him refusing to show up for a few episodes. The hiring of Mort Lackman as executive producer is often mentioned as one of the great mediating effects on the show. Although it's theorized that Lackman and O'Connor had some kind of friendship outside the show, O'Connor has said that he didn't even know who Lackman was before he met him while working on All in the Family. It could have simply been that Norman Lear, who was increasingly busy with a number of other shows, was less present to oversee the series. There was one instance of an actor not showing up to an episode that I haven't mentioned, and that's in 1974 when Carol O'Connor refused to cross a picket line when the electrical workers were on strike at CBS. This moment would not be the only time we'd see Archie Bunker impacted by a labor action. I propose a toast to the good old US of A, where everybody gets a slice of the pie. Okay. All you gotta do... Is do your work, and in the end you get it. <laughs> Archie Bunker, when we first meet him, works at a loading dock during the week and as a cab driver on the weekend. His last name, Bunker, conveys his mindset as one man holed up against the world. Archie is someone for whom life hasn't quite unfolded the way he might have hoped. He has a home, a wife, and a daughter, but he's working a job for low pay that's slowly breaking his body down. And in the early seasons in particular, we see how tight money is starting to get in the Bunker household. In the first season, there's a scene in the episode, Archie is worried about his job, where we learn a bit more about Archie's background and what he experienced growing up during the Depression. My old man never got old. Took the heart right out of him. He was just about my age now. This gives us a good sense of the precariousness of Archie's livelihood early on. Although a job on a loading dock isn't particularly glamorous, it's all Archie really has. And he has a memory of what it's like to have less. One of the original ideas for Archie was to make him an elevator operator, a job fading from the world. He would lose that job at the end of the first season, and then spend the second season having to find a new one, up against a much younger workforce. 
It was the portrait of an older man out of step with the rest of the world, and it raises the question of what sort of answers the world has for a blue-collar guy who's run into some bad luck. In an interview, Carol O'Connor summed up Archie, saying, Archie's dilemma is coping with a world that is changing in front of him. He isn't a totally evil man. He wouldn't burn a cross. He's shrewd, but he won't get to the problem, because the root of the problem is himself, and he doesn't know it. In The Insurance is Cancelled, we get an idea of how Archie fits into a wider system. In the episode, Archie has to deal with his home's insurance being cancelled while wrestling with the decision of which of three men to fire. And to clarify, Archie isn't the boss at his job, he's just in charge of his crew and is making a recommendation to his boss. Archie has to decide between three different workers, Stretch Cunningham, Black Elmo, and Little Emmanuel. They're white, black, and Puerto Rican, respectively. And their race plays a big role in how Archie makes his decision. You're saying Emmanuel and Elmo are your best men. That's right, and Stretch Cunningham's incompetent, but he's white, so he stays. Look, I couldn't fire Stretch Cunningham even if I wanted to. There's 60 other white guys down there, and they'd murder me if I'd done a thing like that. It's not just Archie's personal racism, but his assumption that the other white workers all feel like him. And he might be right about that. Archie decides that, as great a worker as Emmanuel is, he's the one Archie is going to recommend be fired. Boss, why'd you have to pick on little Emmanuel? Listen, he's your best worker. There's colored guys and white guys working down here. He's the only Puerto Rican he'll ever be missed. Afterwards, the insurance company guy, who happens to be Edith's nephew Wendell, explains why the bunker policy was cancelled. Your insurance has not been cancelled. It's been economically terminated. Wait a minute, don't terminate and mean the same thing as cancelled? And we see Archie use similar language when he has to explain to Emmanuel why he lost his job. You wasn't really fired. You were what we call in a the business there, um, unfortunately terminated. <laughs> Wendell explains that the insurance company had to cancel the policy not because of anything Archie has done, but because the neighborhood lines were redrawn and the proportionally higher black population of Archie's new neighborhood means the insurance company doesn't want to take the supposed increased risk of insuring people in that new neighborhood. Although Archie pleads for some understanding, Wendell can't give him a break. The decisions are made upstairs, that's the way the system operates. What can I do about it? You could do something about it if you wanted to. After all, you're Edith's nephew here. Why couldn't you go up to the president and say something? Ain't you man enough to do that? It's interesting to contrast those lines to the ones Archie uses when he speaks to Emmanuel. I'm only a little man, see? These decisions are made by, by the big man. Upstairs. <laughs> know what I mean? It's the system, Emmanuel. You can't talk to the system. I mean, it ain't a person, you know. It's, uh, it's... I don't know what it is. What this episode so effectively illustrates is not just how people are pressed into service for a system that treats them as disposable, but will also turn them into agents of that system where they will do similar things to the people beneath them. When Archie says he doesn't know what the system is, it reflects the alienation he's not aware of. While he can yell at Wendell to do his part, he's likely in a similar situation. What can one worker really do to push back against a system that treats someone they care about like garbage? Of course, we can always flip this episode on its head, as Archie could have tried to put his prejudice aside to fire the relatively useless Stretch Cunningham. Though the pressure from other workers might have been bad, ultimately Archie could have done something unpopular to ensure the hard-working Emmanuel kept his job. While one man can't stop a system, one man can do something to make it a little more just, if he's willing to take the pain that comes with that. Of course, Archie experiencing pain because of that is another feature of the system. And in this case, it works with Archie's racism to help him turn a blind eye to the little good he could have done. Archie's struggle is the struggle of the white working class in 1970s America that feels left behind. And thanks in part to the racism inherited from his father, the anger of being left behind is misdirected away from the power structures that failed Archie and instead placed on people who typically have even less power than him. Archie being a blue-collar bigot got some angry responses from labor organizers. In 1972, Bob Kaysen, editor of Focus, a Teamster newsletter, said, The average worker is no dingpat, maligned in public. He knows he's being made fun of by the so-called opinion makers. And Vernon E. Jordan Jr., executive director of the National Urban League, told the 16th Constitutional Convention of the United Steelworkers of America, The Archie bunkerization of the American working man is a myth fed by the media, by the enemies of both working people and black people, and by those who would roll the clock back to the good old days when blacks knew their place and unions weren't recognized. 
And to the degree that the general public is convinced that labor is selfish and bigoted, the labor movement will lose the moral standing and public goodwill it needs to succeed in its aims. Perhaps in response to those complaints, or ones like them, we got a better sense of Archie as a blue-collar worker who isn't just a clown in the fourth season four-parter opener called The Bunkers and Inflation, where we see Archie's union go on strike. All the inflation cost a little. I mean, I mean, things could get very tough. What made this episode really stand out was how relevant it felt. With labor actions and inflation impacting the present day, it's a reminder that workers don't go on strike because they want to, but because they feel like they need to. Archie, who doesn't want to strike, stands by his union. Throughout the episodes, it's interesting to see Archie's reactionary politics contrasted with his support for his union, in large part because he knows his union has done a lot for him, and it reinforces the importance of providing some sort of material benefit to collective action. Of course, even going along with his union, Archie does complain the whole time. As things get increasingly desperate, with the bunkers considering a second mortgage for their home, a deal is finally reached. The strike is over! The devil is in the details, though. The deal reached gives Archie a 15% raise for three years, but it won't do enough to keep up with inflation. The cost of living went up 12% last year. So? So next year it's supposed to go up another 8%. That's 20%. There's a real tragedy to the resolution of this labor action, and it was largely driven by the older workers at Archie's workplace shouting down the younger ones who wanted a deal that had a longer impact. It's difficult to be too hard on Archie, as it's pretty clear that he and Edith were facing some devastating financial troubles if the strike had gone on any longer, but it reflects how workers are often set against one another to break labor actions, and the desperation of people so utterly dependent on their jobs is a way in which employers can extract concessions from workers who only want something as simple as their wages to keep up with inflation. Archie would find himself in even more trouble in Season 7's The Unemployment Story, where Archie loses the job he's had for 30 years. Wait, 30 years of faithful service for the same company, and what do you get with <laughs> Archie is part of layoffs after his company loses the government contract, and we see Archie struggle while watching Michael's career begin to take off. He's published something, so that means he's well on his way to a lifetime of security. Oh, a lifetime of security. I wish they'd give that to people who really work for a living. And in the next episode, Archie gets a new job. The story then turns into Archie having to undergo gallbladder surgery. It's an episode that I got to make a cameo in. Jose, where'd you going? And in the final episode of this four-episode saga, Archie gets his job back along with a promotion. This series of four episodes is interesting to contrast with the one where Archie's union goes on strike. The strike episodes were more focused on the survival of the Bunker household while Archie struggles for a fair shake at his job, only to end up with a deal that's at best a half measure. On the other hand, when Archie is fired, he bounces back relatively quickly getting a job in the next episode, and then it turns into a story about the cost of medical care. And then eventually he's back at his old job, with a promotion no less. While it's an entertaining journey, and has a few points to make about working class struggles, particularly when it comes to medical insurance, it isn't as focused and gets wrapped up a little too neatly. Season 7 also gave us the episode Fire, where Archie tries to scam his insurance company after a fire. So you looked everything over, and uh, so it's going to come to how much? Uh, nothing. <laughs> Not only does Archie get nothing, but his premiums are going up. Now contrast that episode to the earlier episode where Archie loses his home insurance. In that one, we see Archie's place in a larger system, and it served as a broader critique of the world in which Archie lives in. In Fire, Archie is just a goof who fails to manipulate his insurance company. And this is true when you contrast the episodes about inflation and Archie being fired. The earlier episodes have a greater degree of sophistication. They tell a broader story of what it means to be a blue-collar worker in America, rather than what it means to be Archie Bunker in his crazy little world something that's more emphasized by the later seasons. While they're certainly still enjoyable, and the later seasons did bring us some great episodes, I think it's important to point out this particular distinction. We would see Archie change even further as he would eventually purchase his local bar during the show's eighth season, something Norman Lear reportedly fought against. This change heralded the show's shift away from Archie as a blue-collar worker as he stepped into the middle class. Oh, this was a most enchanting young person. Boy or girl? A boy? Why did I ask? 
first season of All in the Family has this anxious quality to it where it was hurriedly trying to cover as many hot-button topics as possible. It created the impression of a show that felt the need to say as much as it could before it was yanked off the air. And so we got a gay character in what was only the fifth episode of the series, judging books by covers. The episode was a fairly basic one where Michael and Gloria's friend Roger stops by the bunker home. Who's the big cheese you're having here for lunch? Roger. Roger the fairy? All right. Archie would go on to use much stronger language later in the episode. The ironic twist would see Archie go to his local bar, Kelsey's, where he runs into a friend he's shocked to find out is gay. I mean, I ain't the brightest guy in the world. You want to put me on, put me on, but don't sit there and tell me to do... I mean, look at you, look at... Come on, will you big clown? You get out of here. The lesson is you can't always tell who is or isn't gay based on their mannerisms and appearance, which is nice enough. But the episode daring to feature gay characters as regular people was enough to be considered controversial. The episode's most notable critic was President Richard Nixon, as revealed in some of the recordings he made. And I should remind you all, this was the reaction to just featuring a gay character in the episode. All in the Family wouldn't really touch on this issue in more than a few episodes, though when it did, it delved a little more deeply into the subject. In Cousin Liz, Edith has to attend her cousin's funeral, and she meets Liz's longtime friend, Veronica, only to realize they were more than friends. More like a marriage. A marriage? Oh, but it couldn't be. I mean, you and Cousin Liz was both gay... <laughs> the conflict in the episode is that Edith inherited a silver tea set from her cousin, but she decides to leave it with Veronica, played by Kay Kalin, instead, a gesture to recognize the importance of their relationship. Loving somebody and not being able to talk about it. I, you can have the tea set. I mean, it belongs to you. You're really her next of kin. It's a sweet example of how accepting Edith is, but aside from showing some humanity to a gay character, the episode also touches on how Liz and Veronica had to keep their relationship a secret, in part because they would have lost their jobs as teachers. A bit of social commentary that revealed some of the systemic structures that made it so difficult for anyone in the LGBT plus community to live openly. Reflecting on the episode, Kay Kalin said, I was told that the episode was conceived in response to the campaign by Anita Bryant, who was a singer and orange juice spokesperson, to fire school teachers for being gay. That's why my character Veronica was a teacher. I've been told that when the episode was finished, CBS said they weren't going to air it. And I heard Norman's response was, well, you won't be airing anything else for me. Perhaps most notable from these episodes is the character of Beverly LaSalle, played by Laurie Shannon. We first meet Beverly in the episode Archie the Hero, where we find out Archie saved Beverly's life with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, unaware that Beverly was in drag. I'm no lady. Ah. <laughs> the creation of Beverly LaSalle was done with some consultation, specifically Newt Dieter from the Gay Media Task Force, who advised the writers to create Beverly with some depth. Although Dieter had attempted to convince the writers to disentangle Beverly as a performer in drag from being gay, perhaps even having a wife, that ultimately would be ignored. Beverly would appear in two more episodes, though it was Beverly's final appearance in Edith's Crisis of Faith that was particularly notable. In it, Beverly is visiting Edith to drop off a Christmas present for her, and when walking to the subway station with Michael, Beverly is attacked. This one guy had a lead pipe just as he was about to hit me over the head. Beverly tackled him. He saved my life. But then two of them just, uh, they started just beating on Beverly. I guess they figured out what he was, and they just started smashing him with the pipe. I, I don't want to hear anything. I'm sorry, he just died. Aww. The two-parter is less about Beverly and more about the grief Edith feels over losing a friend. So much so that Edith loses her faith in God. The way I feel today, I may not go to church ever. As the family struggles, we see how Edith's faith was a big part of what kept it together. And ironically, it's Michael, the atheist, who helps Edith find religion again. And we're supposed to be God's children. It don't make sense. I don't understand nothing no more. 
Maybe we're not supposed to understand everything all at once. Maybe we're just supposed to understand things a little bit at a time. It's another difficult episode where we have to watch Edith suffer, though Beverly being killed to advance this whole story does make it seem like an almost token gesture to the reality of hate crimes. And a comment from Eric Tarloff, the writer who came up with this story, reveals how small a part of the idea it was. In my initial draft, the victim of the murder was not Beverly LaSalle, but a young minister friend of Mike's. Although the earlier episode, Judging Books by Covers, would get a negative review from President Nixon, Edith's Crisis of Faith got a warmer reception from President Carter. Norman Lear explained in his book, It was a thrill to stand there in the Oval Office, listening to our president talk about episodes he and Rosalind had seen and remembered, especially the one where Edith lost and regained her faith. And that Reverend Bleeding Heart Felcher up there in his ivory shower. <laughs> With Archie being a nominal Protestant, Edith being a practicing one, and Michael and Gloria both being atheists, there's fertile ground for some spirited religious discussion in the bunker home. Norman Lear said in his biography, Not that the show didn't deal with God and religion, but for eight years we avoided labeling Archie in that regard. In the ninth season, we see very clearly that the bunkers are Episcopal. What are we? <laughs> Episcopal. Yeah, whatever. Perhaps it's more accurate to say that Edith is a practicing Episcopal while Archie is vaguely Christian as he rarely ever goes to church. Edith the Good was the title of a book written by a clergyman named Spencer Marsh that explored Edith's relationship to religion. Unlike Archie, she is very open in her devout nature and the church typically comes into contact with the bunker home through her. Her moral character is best summed up as she is both good in a theological and in a humanistic sense, with a depth of caring that makes sense even to Mike the Atheist. And it's certainly true that Edith attributes her good nature to her religious faith. As I discussed earlier, her loss of that faith in the two-parter where Beverly LaSalle is murdered is revealed as underpinning so much of what made the bunker home livable. And perhaps it was the patience of a saint Edith needed to put up with a husband like Archie. In the 20th anniversary special, a priest described Archie saying, Following his, his own lights, his own conscience, and struggling to do the best he could. Yes, I would say Archie was a good Christian. Could he be better? Yes, Archie could be better. Most of the time, we really only get a sense of Archie's faith when he feels threatened by others, typically when he's arguing with Michael and Gloria about their atheism. Although most of the arguments don't amount to much more than some shouting and occasionally hurt feelings, the stakes are a bit higher in Season 6's The Little Atheist, where Archie and Michael have a fight over how Michael and Gloria's future baby should be raised. Now, this is my house, it's going to be my child, and no one is going to force his religious beliefs on his family. When baby Joey is born a couple of episodes later, Archie takes things into his own hands in the episode ominously titled Joey's Baptism. I hope that took, Lord, because... They're gonna kill me when I get home. <laughs> the episode was strange in that it felt like a win for Archie. Although Michael and Gloria expressed their anger towards him in later episodes, this one just ends with the baptism and the promise of repercussions in some later episode. It's a strange note to go out on. In a way that feels very much of its time, Archie is distrustful of Catholics. But I tell you the truth, I ain't got no respect for no religion where the head guy claims he can't make no mistakes, you know, like he's, what do you call him, flammable? <laughs> that is most frequently seen when the Lorenzos move into Archie Bunker's neighborhood, with Frank Lorenzo being played by Vincent Gardenia and Irene Lorenzo being played by Betty Garrett. Don't you think we should say a few words first? Yeah, I know just the words to say. Blasting me, damn the skin, open your kisser and cram it in. <laughs> Although Irene would be around for about three seasons, Frank would only appear in one. And of course, Archie also has a very heavy helping of anti-Semitism. Although this usually takes the shape of looking for a Jewish lawyer or doctor, he also has a general suspicion that Jewish people plot among one another, and he uses occasional slurs I won't be repeating here. The series does take some time to have him confront those prejudices, though, such as when he has to give a eulogy at Stretch Cunningham's funeral, not realizing his friend was Jewish. I mean, he wasn't a doctor or a lawyer in a dress business, nothing like that. <laughs> he was just, like myself, he was just a, a, an ordinary, uh, hard-working stiff. And, uh, and, <laughs> Perhaps the most intense of these episodes was Archie is Branded, where Archie discovers that his door has had a swastika painted on it. 
The painting was left as a threat because Archie is confused for one of his Jewish neighbors, something he finds out when he gets a visit from a member of the Hebrew Defense Association, more specifically, one of its members, Paul Benjamin, played by Gregory Sierra. The HDA specialize in violent responses to anti-Semitism. Just because some people do some terrible things to other people doesn't give you the right to do the same thing. That's just revenge. What's the matter with revenge? It's the perfect way to get in. <laughs> what follows is a long discussion about the impact of responding to violence with more violence, with Archie happily taking the side of Paul, while Michael argues for a more peaceful response. One of these days, you're going to find out that this is the only answer right there. I still think you're wrong, because this only gets you this. The episode has All in the Family's most shocking ending, as the conversation that seems to wrap everything up is interrupted by an explosion. That's Paul. They blew him up in his car. This episode does little to offer any real solutions to the problems detailed. The type of nonviolence Michael preaches is easy enough to champion when you aren't being personally threatened. But Archie's brutish attitude isn't much better, as it just perpetuates a cycle. A better question might be how religious intolerance escalates to violence, an answer that Archie is likely on the wrong side of. Norman Lear described the ending of this episode in his memoir, writing, No musical sting, no applause, just a slow fade to black. The audience was as shocked as the actors and it was the loudest silence I'd ever heard. Marty is here. <laughs> With the wild success of All in the Family came the desire for spin-offs, and there would be quite a few, each succeeding and failing to wildly varying degrees. In season two of All in the Family, we got Cousin Maud's Visit, which introduced us to B. Arthur as Edith's Cousin Maud. Arthur's fierce performance served as a very strong counter to Archie. Now you can either come to the table and eat, or you can lie there and feed off your own fat. <laughs> Maud was such a well-designed foil for Archie, it was almost a shame she got her own show. Things were moving so quickly that by the end of season two, we got a backdoor pilot in All in the Family with an episode titled Maud. I just love weddings. You're telling us, Maud, you've been married yourself four times. <laughs> Much like All in the Family, Maud would tackle a wide array of topical issues, including abortion and alcoholism, only with a liberal feminist as the primary focus of the series. Maud ran for six seasons, and B. Arthur won an Emmy for her portrayal of the character in 1977. The next spin-off was Good Times, and while it might not be considered an All in the Family one, because it technically was spun off from Maud, it does typically get counted since it couldn't have happened without All in the Family existing first. Starring Esther Roll and John Amos as Florida and James, Good Times focuses on the life of the Evans family, living in a lower-income neighborhood in Chicago. Over time, Jimmy Walker, as their son JJ, slowly rose to prominence, and some controversy swirled around the show about its depiction of black Americans. Good Times ran for six seasons. Slightly related to All in the Family, though, is that the series was co-created by Mike Evans, who played Lionel on the show. His fellow Good Times co-creator Eric Monte had a falling out with Norman Lear and sued Lear to be compensated as the co-creator for the series. It was eventually settled out of court. Also, I should mention that Monte is claimed to have created George and Louise Jefferson for All in the Family. Based on my research, that doesn't seem to have been the case. Aside from Monty never being credited with writing a single episode of All in the Family, by all accounts, it was Mike Evans who discovered him and brought him into the production. And unless Evans brought in Monte before the first episode of All in the Family aired, Monty's involvement would have been in 1971 or later. A series of documents published in All in the Family, the show that changed everything, clearly showed the ideas for Lionel's parents, including his father coming into some money and running a dry cleaning business, that were all created before the pilot was shot. Hence, Michael still going by Richard and Archie being an elevator operator rather than a dock worker. So even though there's no date on here, this would likely have been created in 1970 or earlier. While it's possible Monty had some input towards how the characters developed at some point, as Lair was known for trying to find black writers for his staff, there's no evidence to support the idea he created either George or Louise Jefferson. At least, none that I could find. I can't really comment on any of the other claims made by Monty, as they're about shows I wasn't really researching, but for whatever it's worth, it seems clear to me that he was the co-creator of Good Times. The next spin-off would arguably be the most successful of them, The Jeffersons, starring Sherman Hemsley and Isabel Sanford. It followed the Jeffersons as they moved on up and out of the neighborhood the bunkers were in and into an apartment in Manhattan. 
The Jeffersons, like Maude, got a backdoor pilot in an episode of All in the Family titled The Jeffersons Move Up. I won't be drinking out of mugs no more. From now on, it's cups and saucers all the way. Come on, Louise, the limousine is with the Jeffersons went on to run for 11 seasons, giving it an even longer run than All in the Family. Isabel Sanford won an Emmy for Outstanding Actress in a Comedy Series in 1981. Although it would be a massive success, at first Isabel Sanford turned down the chance to star in a spinoff because she wanted to stay in All in the Family. All in the Family is successful. I don't know what the Jeffersons is going to do. I'd rather stay with All in the Family. She says, we will get an actress to do Louise Jefferson, and we'll write Louise Jefferson out of All in the Family. Well, that helped me make up my mind right then and there, which one to accept. The Jeffersons led to the very short-lived spin-off Checking In, featuring the Jefferson's maid, Florence Johnston, played by Marla Gibbs. As it only ran for four episodes, there isn't too much to say about it. There's also a second quasi spin-off called ER, I should mention. And don't get it confused, even though the cast did include George Clooney and Mary McDonnell, it is not the same as the NBC drama series ER that would debut 10 years later. The difference in the titles is that there is a forward slash between the E and the R for the sitcom. This series ran for 22 episodes, and nurse Julie Williams, played by Lynn Moody, was George Jefferson's niece. ER often doesn't get counted as a spin-off, but since it's by the same production company, I'm going to count it here. But we won't go too crazy and start counting every appearance of George and Louise Jefferson as a spin-off of the Jeffersons. Otherwise, we'd be counting shows like The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Although some might argue it's more a sequel than a spin-off, Archie Bunker's Place followed All in the Family after it went off the air following its ninth season. I have a whole section where I'll be discussing the show in detail later on. The next spin-off we have is Gloria, featuring Sally Struthers raising her son Joey while working at a veterinarian's office, although it was really only notable for including Burgess Meredith in the cast. The series ran for a single season before it was cancelled. The last spin-off was 704 Hauser, airing in 1994. The series starred John Amos of Good Times fame as the head of the Cumberbatch family, who were moving into the former home of the Bunkers. Although none of the Bunkers appeared in the series, there was a cameo from Gloria and Michael's son, Joey Stivic, played by Casey Shamashko. The show ran for six episodes. There's a technical term for guys like you. There's a technical term for guys like you. <laughs> Being a hit show isolates a series from many of the demands from the network and protests from the public. But even a massive hit like All in the Family was still subject to some of the pressures that built up over the years. In 1974, there was a growing criticism of the sex and violence that was becoming more common on American television. From 1972 to 1973, viewer complaints to the FCC jumped from 2,500 to 33,000. The popular example at the time was a lesbian rape scene in the 1974 TV movie Born Innocent that aired on NBC. As a response, in 1975, the FCC urged the National Association of Broadcasters, which represented the networks, make a change. So the National Association of Broadcasters designated a family viewing hour each evening between 8 and 9 p.m. This designated hour would feature programming more suitable to a family audience. Although All in the Family was not the worst offender, it was nonetheless subject to these new rules, and rather than tone down the show's content, Norman Lear decided to keep the series as is and have it moved to a different time slot. Lear reflected on this period, writing, I said there was no way I was going to, or would have any idea how to, change America's most popular show to meet the vague standards of decency that the family hour demanded. A few days later, the fall schedule was announced, with All in the Family moved to Monday at 9pm where young minds, sleep now of course, could be spared its wicked ways. Lear and a group of other producers, including Alan Alda, Mary Tyler Moore, and Carol O'Connor, sued the National Association of Broadcasters for violating their First Amendment rights. As part of the fight against the family viewing hour, the cast of All in the Family even sang a variation of their opening theme called These Are the Days. We can show my pregnancy And John Boy can have VD <laughs> Plus a quick vasectomy. <laughs> After nine o'clock. They won that suit a year and a half later, and the family viewing hour was later abolished. 
In his book, Josh Ozersky argues that by the time the Family Viewing Hour was no longer in use, it had already succeeded in marginalizing shows like All in the Family, which fell from its spot as the top show in America and was replaced by the far more family-friendly Happy Days, as American audiences started to drift more towards less controversial programs. Christina von Hodenberg argues otherwise, noting that All in the Family was moved in the schedule before the Family Viewer Hour came into effect, and was used by CBS as a weapon to counter-program against other networks. When the Family Viewer Hour showed up, it exacerbated the problem, because it triggered another time slot move, but it was more the cumulative effect of constantly changing time slots that made it difficult for viewers to keep up with the bunkers. All in the Family moved from Saturday at 8 p.m. in 1974 to Monday at 9 p.m. in 1975, to Wednesday at 9 in 1976, to Saturday at 9 also in 1976, to Sunday at 9 in 1977, and then Sunday at 8 in 1978. All those time slot changes, coupled with a gradual softening of the character of Archie, lessening the bite of the character over time, are attributed to the show's decline in the ratings. I think both hypotheses are slightly incomplete, while there are probably a number of factors that contribute to All in the Family's drop in popularity, I think it's important to point out that it was always a relatively popular show. At its absolute worst in the ratings, it was still ranked 12th overall with 22.9% of households watching. When it finished its final season, it was ranked 9th with a rating of 24.9. To talk of the decline of one of the most popular shows of all time is to really say it went from incredibly popular to merely popular, and it's a decline any show would be lucky to have. Also, and perhaps more importantly, it was following the path of pretty much every television show, whether they're hits or modest successes. Audiences grow tired over time and tend to lose interest in the same program, and ratings decline. While that isn't always the case for every single show, there are the odd sleeper hits that build over the seasons. I think it's safe to assume that the top show in America was a known quantity, and the only place for its ratings to really go was gradually down. And so All in the Family survived pressure from the government in the shape of the Family Viewing Hour and the machinations of CBS's programming division. But it was constantly under the scrutiny of the network for the various controversies it might stir up. And there was another controversy I want to highlight involving a scene in All in the Family which featured nudity. In the episode Archie the Babysitter, we would see Archie changing his grandson Joey's diaper. In the 200th episode of the series, a special which Norman Lear hosted and played clips from the show, he spent some time talking about the network's reaction to this moment when they read it in the script. They wanted to be sure that when Archie diapered the baby, we cut about here, so that his hands and the infant's parts were out of camera range. We asked why, and the individual that came to us laughed, and he said, come on, you know why you can't do that on television. There's going to be a tremendous knee-jerk reaction in the middle of the country. It's always the, the middle of the country that won't understand, they say. But the middle of the country survived that shot, and not one state seceded from the Union. <laughs> Norman Lear would later write in his biography, Archie Diapery and his grandson was as dear as it was funny. For perhaps an instant, the child was fully exposed, and, assuming they spotted it in the first place, if any of the 40 million viewers were offended by the little bugger's doohickey, they never let us know. I don't like a, an ocean where the sun goes down. I like an ocean where the sun comes up. <laughs> As All in the Family was heading into its eighth season, the show was starting to take on a very different shape. Gloria and Michael had moved out and had their first child. Edith was working in the world. And Archie was becoming a bit more lovable as we saw him dote on his grandson. Joey's bald. <laughs> don't say that, Barney. He ain't bald. He just ain't got too much hair. Archie loudly complaining about black people moving into his neighborhood is awful, but Archie loudly defending the cuteness of his baby grandson is sweet. And learning about why Archie's chair means so much to him makes the guy even more endearing. And my little girl, Glory, when she was little, I give her her bottles right in his chair. All oh, the fun I have with my little girl in his chair. Yeah, so did I. <laughs> He's still an old bigot, but it's a lot easier to see the softer side of him in these later seasons, and his bigotry seems to have softened a bit. One episode I especially want to focus on is Season 7's The Draft Dodger. In this episode, the Bunkers enjoy Christmas dinner with Archie's friend Pinky, played by Eugene Roche, and Michael's friend David, played by Rennie Temple. David, as the title suggests, avoiding the draft during the Vietnam War, while Pinky lost his son in the same war. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, son. 
As everyone sits around the dinner table, people get to talking and the truth comes out. No, sir. I'm not a deserter. Well, I didn't think you was. I was just trying to figure I'm out... I'm a draft what dodger. <laughs> As you might expect, a big argument erupts, and Michael insists Archie acknowledge the mistake of the Vietnam War. How the hell are you going to admit that the war was wrong? I ain't talking about that war! I don't want to talk about that rotten damn war no more! I'm talking about something else! And what he done was wrong! The word rotten was originally ad-libbed as God by O'Connor, though it would later have to be removed at the request of the network, and they dubbed in a different line. But you can still see Archie's lips definitely aren't saying rotten. When Archie finally gives the floor to Pinky, we see him share his opinion. My kid hated the war too. But he did what he thought he had to do. And David here did what he thought he had to do. But David's alive to share Christmas dinner with us. And if Steve were here, he'd want to sit down with him. And that's what I want to do. The episode ends on an interesting note where Archie seems genuinely at a loss, and possibly, in a very rare moment, seems to have learned something from the experience. An event almost unthinkable in earlier seasons. The dinner's over. I still gotta work this out. You better remind me to do that, Edith. <laughs> Reflecting on the public's reaction, the episode's writer, Jay Moriarty, said, At the time, I thought for sure 90-plus percent of viewers were going to agree with Meathead on this one, but actually it was 50-50. Like now, the country was incredibly divided and polarized, and the brilliance of Norman Lear is, he turned that into comedy. Although a modern audience might be more willing to side with Michael in the present, the reaction back then reflect just how raw a nerve the Vietnam War still was, and how even if something seems obviously wrong in hindsight, it's not always so easy for those who went along with it to reckon with the choices they made. The episode was recreated over 40 years later in a special called Live in Front of a Studio Audience, with Woody Harrelson as Archie and Marissa Tomei as Edith, along with a number of other actors recreating the episode. Even if the specific subject of the Vietnam War may be less relevant, the explosive political debate at dinner during the holidays is still something people go through every year. Going back to Archie's evolution in the later seasons, by far his biggest transformation would commence at the beginning of season 8 with the two-parter, Archie Gets the Business. When Archie finds out his neighborhood bar is for sale, he decides to mortgage his home to buy it, making one last grab for the American dream. I want to tell people where to go and what to do. Yeah, I know, Archie. You want to raise yourself up? That's it, that's it. Archie goes against Edith's wishes, and he forges her signature to get the bar. Although she's upset at first, Michael reminds her of Archie's state of mind. He never had a chance to better himself. Well, now he's got that chance, Ma. When the bar opens, we see Archie embrace the possibility of being more than what he once was. It seems like only yesterday you were one of the guys coming in here to drink a few beers and get away from their wives. Everybody liked you. That's all finished, Harry. As Archie invests more of his time in the bar and it struggles to stay afloat, he ends up turning to taking drugs to cope. And we see him struggle with addiction in the two-parter, Archie's Bitter Pill. Oh, hey, hey, don't look like that. Hey, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing, Edith. All of this is classical in the family. Archie struggling to succeed, only to find out the system isn't set up for a guy like him to make it. It's designed to keep a blue-collar guy like him exactly where he is. It echoed an earlier episode where Archie went back to school to get his GED so he could get a promotion, only to find out it was going to his boss's nephew. But as the eighth season progressed, things just started going better at the bar, and all of a sudden we see Archie becoming a successful businessman. This is very much not classical in the family. Whereas we typically saw Archie's plans and schemes fail, this one working out against all the odds is the sort of happy ending the series just wasn't prone to, and perhaps it was simply the series trying to go out on a happy note, wrapping up Archie's story with a little bit of hope. Season 8 was supposed to be the final one for the series. That's made incredibly clear in the final episodes of the season, where we see another part of the story come to a close as Michael is offered a job in California, meaning he, Gloria, and Joey will have to move across the country. We see some tearful goodbyes in the Stivics Go West. I love you, Ma. I love you, Gloria. I love you, Daddy. Well, Daddy certainly loves you, little girl. I love you, Mike. I love you, Ma. In spite of all the fighting, we get a good sense that Archie and Michael really do love one another. You've been like a father to me. Well, I, you know, uh, 
You've been just like a son to me. You never did nothing I ever told you to do. It's really an impressive bit of acting to watch Archie struggle to express his emotions, at least when other people are around. You'll be sure and send uh, postcards every now and then, will you? Of course, your mother-in-law, she's, she's going she's to want to know that you're all right. You know? <clears throat> One of the saddest parts of the episode is seeing Archie and Edith crying apart. I, I got you a beer, Archie! Here I come! This was a devastating finale. In addition to it being a sad goodbye, it was also sad to see Archie trapped in a prison where he can't express his sadness with his wife, and Edith doesn't even feel like she can comfort him. This could have been a moment for growth, but that's not who Archie is, sadly. At least, not in this moment. You empathize with him, but you pity him too. Maybe that's the essence of who this character is. We're being told not to look at him with contempt, but to understand where he's coming from. It's an empathy exercise for the audience. And so the last we nearly see of the bunkers is Archie and Edith sitting alone in their living room. But this would not be the end of the series. Reflecting on this episode, Rob Reiner said in an interview, We had all decided that this was going to be the end of the series. All of us. Not just Carol and Jean and Sally and me, but also the writers and Norman. So we wrote this to be the last show, and Carol was the one who pushed for it harder than anybody else. He didn't want to do the show anymore. And then at some point he said, Wait a minute, maybe I'll do more. Norman Lear wrote in his book, that was the natural ending to the series. But the relentlessly contrarian Carol, who had been saying he wanted out for years, changed his mind at the last minute and, with the network's blessing, convinced Gene to do one more season without Rob and Sally. Edith don't need no helpless child hanging around demanding all her attention. She's got me. <laughs> with Archie and Edith being the only two members from the original cast still on the show, All in the Family needed some faces to fill the void. That came with the introduction of Stephanie Mills, played by Danielle Brisebois. Stephanie was the daughter of Edith's cousin Floyd, who leaves his daughter to be raised by the Bunkers. I was sort of hoping that maybe you could uh, look after Stephanie for me for a couple of weeks. As you might guess, that couple of weeks lasts a lot longer than that. Breeze Ball had a lengthy career for her young age, having spent the previous six years in commercials, TV roles, and on stage. Norman Lear had seen her on Broadway and thought she would be a good addition to the cast. In an interview, Breeze Ball recalled of her character, I think she was one of the only people who was actually able to get to Archie, get him to soften up. I had him in the palm of my hand. I could make him do anything I wanted. Stephanie was really smart, really shrewd, but she didn't abuse her gift. She cared a lot about people and all she really wanted was a happy life. The character was never really described to me, but that's how Carol and I developed her together. And I wasn't too crazy about you when I first met you, but I like you. I like you too. You're cute for your age. <laughs> One interesting wrinkle to the Stephanie character came in the episode Stephanie's Conversion, in which it's revealed that she is Jewish. He said if Uncle Archie knew, he would call me a heap. Archie, seemingly not acting to his type, is surprisingly okay with Stephanie being Jewish. That gorgeous family of yours over there hiding this all these years. Oh, what a bunch of bigots they are. A shame to have one Jewish person in the family. Oh. Of course, Archie being Archie, he wants her to hide her religion at first. Though by the end of the episode, he grows to accept her being openly Jewish. Yeah, I just happened to be passing the store. It's a moment of growth for Archie that shows just how much he's changed from the early seasons of the series. Stephanie would be one of the last contributions Norman Lear would have to the series, as in its ninth season, Alan Horn would become the show's production supervisor, and Carol O'Connor became the showrunner. One of the immediate big changes was recording the series in a closed studio instead of in front of a live studio audience, giving the episodes a slightly different feel. The ninth season did include guest appearances by Sally Struthers and Rob Reiner reprising the roles in a two-parter that had Archie and Edith visiting them in California. Nice to see you, Archie. Yeah, nice to see you, Michael. You're calling me Michael, isn't that nice? What the hell, it's Christmas. <laughs> the final episode of All in the Family was Too Good Edith, where we see Edith struggle to keep up with the demands Archie places on her. Could we get a caterer to do the cooking? Edith, after me bragging to everybody that you're the best cabbage cook in the world, not a chance. Eventually, the stress gets to Edith. And at every fancy bowl, and when we play at funerals, we play the march 
Edith, what are you doing here, huh? What's wrong? I, I, call Dr. Shapiro. When Archie figures out what's happening, he focuses all his time on taking care of Edith. I'm gonna tell you something. I ain't nothing without you. The last line of the series is a callback to the first episode. You're a pip, you know that? <laughs> a real pip. You're a pip. <laughs> a real pip. This ending is a lot more hopeful than the downbeat ending of the previous season. We see Archie and Edith, in spite of their hardships, looking like they're going to be okay, even if it did take a serious medical emergency for Archie to ease up on how much he asked of Edith. This might have been another place the series could have wrapped things up and we would say goodbye to the bunkers. But, under a new name, the show went on. This, Harry, is a day that will live in infancy. <laughs> After the ninth season of All in the Family, Jean Stapleton had little interest in reprising her role as Edith Bunker, at least not as a principal cast member in a series. And with her departure, only Carol O'Connor was left from the original cast of All in the Family. Speaking to TV Guide in 1979, Carol said, Bob Daly, president of CBS Entertainment, called and said he still wanted to air some variation of the show, some kind of Archie situation, even though Jean Stapleton, Rob Reiner, and Sally Struthers had departed. Initially, Norman Lear resisted the idea of having Archie go off on his own, but gradually he relented after O'Connor personally went to him to ask for his permission, at the behest of CBS. The series would move forward under the title Archie Bunker's Place. Joining Carol O'Connor from All in the Family would be Daniel Brisebois, continuing on as Stephanie Mills. Alan Melvin, who played Archie's friend Barney Hefner, would go from series regular to the principal cast. Jason Wingreen as Harry Snowden, the bartender at Archie Bunker's place, and Bill Quinn as Mr. Van Rensselaer, a blind man who was a regular bar patron, also became recurring figures on the new series. Joining the cast would be Martin Balsam as Murray Klein, Archie's new business partner, having purchased Harry's half of the bar, and Gene Stapleton would appear as Edith in five episodes. Over the years, a number of other actors would join the cast, including many new additions that dramatically increased the amount of representation on the show. From the opening moments of the new series, a version of Those Were the Days starts playing without its lyrics, and this immediately feels like an imitation of another show. And we were seeing Archie in a whole new light. Instead of Archie's bigotry being met with a fight from Michael, we would get silence instead. I mean, you gotta admit that you people, uh, you ain't famous for big spending over a bar. This moment in the first episode signaled that things are changing, and so would Archie. We did get another family reunion for Thanksgiving, and Archie's reaction to Michael is almost shocking. Meathead? That's the secret word, Archie! Congratulations! Maybe the distance helped, but it's still strange to see these two getting along. Clearly, Archie is softening. However, there was still one vestige of his all-in-the-family self that clung to him, and that's the presence of Edith. No. Blessed with a life of joy and peace. Amen. Amen. After her last appearance in the first season of Archie Bunker's Place, Jean Stapleton was officially done with the character. The idea of having her go off to stay with relatives was floated, but O'Connor had another idea. You talk to Norman and tell him I can't do this show with a non-existent Edith. We'll have to write a show in which she dies. Norman Lear was very much against this, and Jean Stapleton recalled the conversation where she gave her blessing to kill off Edith. So I said to Norman, Norman, you realize, don't you, she is, uh, is only fiction. There was a long pause, and I thought, oh, I've heard this dear man that I love so much. And then the voice came back, to me, she isn't. Lear would eventually relent, and at the beginning of the second season, Edith would be killed off. The story unfolds in a two-parter, and very interestingly opens with Edith having already died and Archie refusing to acknowledge it, as Archie insists on acting like everything is normal. Do you want to talk? Well, I don't want to bother you while you're doing your homework there, you know? I mean, that's the important thing. You keep it that. In a very powerful moment, after he thinks Edith's things have been taken away, Archie discovers one of her slippers remains, and we finally see him grieve Edith's death. 
You had no right to leave me that way. You... Without giving me just one more chance to say I love you. <laughs> It's almost strange seeing Archie in this state, a man so locked out of his emotions now completely shattered. It's heartbreaking and slightly askew. Norman there wrote about this scene in his book. It could not have been a more touching scene and it played without a laugh to an audience stilled with sorrow. That represented a departure from a dramatic tenet basic to my way of looking at comedy. There is a laugh in every situation. Beware of treacle. In an early All in the Family episode, Archie, about to become a grandfather, visits Gloria at her bedside just after learning she miscarried. He so wanted a grandson, and the audience was numbed by his heartbreak. As directed, however, the scene recognized that these two had never faced such an intimate moment before, and it was amusing to see how they coped with it. The laugh that was evoked served to enhance the empathy between the characters and their audience, bringing many to tears. Without me, Carol's Archie didn't reach for such moments. He simply didn't see comedy my way. The reaction to Edith's death was intense. There were eulogies and memorials in newspapers, and fans asked for her to be brought back. But Edith was truly gone. After the episodes aired, the production company donated $500,000 to the National Organization of Women's Legal Defense and Education Fund to establish the Edith Bunker Memorial Fund for the ERA and women's rights. And on Archie Bunker's place, we got a reminder of Edith when Gloria stopped by for a visit in Season 3. But without Ma, it all seems different. Yeah, well, you know, you get used to that. With Edith gone, we saw more of an emphasis on the characters that Archie met at his bar. And after over a decade of time on television, Archie was becoming a different guy. Mel Tolkien, one of the show's writers, explained. It's not, being, it's not against the world in the same way that Archie Bunker was, against the world that was shattering him. And in his book, Josh Ozersky put it nicely, writing... Archie by this time had commenced his metamorphosis into a crusty but benevolent figure of the kind so common on the airwaves at the time. Supplied with a Jewish partner, a Jewish stepdaughter, Hispanic employees, an Irish cook, and eventually a spunky liberal teenage boarder, and even a black live-in maid, Archie became superficially bigoted. Archie getting that bar was simply a new thing for him to do, but that one decision launched the character on a trajectory that would change the dynamic of his shows. Archie wasn't a blue-collar stiff let down by the American dream. Rather, it had finally come true for him. Although it could be explained that the growing conservatism would reflect the 1980s caught up to Archie, it could just as easily be explained that the medium of television simply caught up to him. TV was always a deeply conservative space, and by trying to mix things up, rather than simply let the series end, it made All in the Family, and then Archie Bunker's Place, feel more like every other show on television. The final episode of Archie Bunker's Place, at the end of its fourth season, was hardly a fitting send-off for one of the all-time classic TV characters. It largely centered around the supporting cast, with Archie being less of a focal point. They had expected a fifth season, but after its finale, found out that the series would instead be cancelled. You're supposed to love your father. Because your father loves you. I want to go back to an episode of All in the Family from its second season called The Elevator Story. The premise is pretty basic, with Archie getting stuck in an elevator with a black lawyer, a white secretary, and a Puerto Rican janitor and his pregnant wife. As Archie struggles with being in closed quarters with many of the various identity groups he's bigoted towards, the janitor's wife goes into labor. Upon seeing the baby, Archie's face completely changes. Got a little boy. Huh? Norman Lear has highlighted this particular moment many times. Here he is doing it in a PBS documentary about his life. And the camera would be on his face at the birth of that child. And it was gold. It was platinum. In an interview, he described it as, Only the rarest of actors could pull it off, which is why I wanted it for Carol. I had to have it. The essence of Archie's humanity is right there on his face. And in his book, Fear goes into detail about the challenges he faced just getting this episode on the air. Immediately after the first table reading, which seemed an agony for Carol, he announced there was no way in the world he would do this show. Carol, who called us together, was there with his agent and his attorney. And with me, in one of the first of many such meetings we were to have, was my attorney. Carol fell to pieces and began to cry. He couldn't go on. 
hated the show, couldn't bear me, and cried to a point that made me realize that this behavior, this degree of testing, had to end here. If he won this battle, the creative team would be throttled and the show I believed in would die anyway. We worked on Saturday, and when the episode was taped, the following Tuesday we got a phenomenal reaction. The audience cheered, some cried, everyone agreed it was our best work to date and simply had to win an Emmy. It did. In a 1971 interview with Carol O'Connor, he describes the depth of his feeling for the character of Archie and his genuine belief that what they were making was art. We've suddenly got into this higher thing, and the pressure to keep it up is enormous. Yeah. What comes across in interviews and reflections like these is the level of passion and dedication that went into creating All in the Family, and specifically the character of Archie Bunker. It was a work of satire designed to bring ugly truths to the television screen and ask the audience to grapple with them. But the lingering question, the one asked all the way back in that New York Times op-ed from Laura Hobson, and the one we see in Archie's face in the elevator, what does it mean to love a bigot? Arthur Berger in the TV Guided American wrote, with Archie Bunker, we got a double payoff, so to speak. We we're able to enjoy the ethnic humor in one sense and condemn it in another. The point is that we can get the forbidden pleasure of aggression against ethnic groups and the pleasure of aggression against the aggressor, and so get twice as much pleasure for our money, or time spent, and we come out smelling like the proverbial rose. Opinions like these weren't uncommon, and during its run, a number of social scientific studies were conducted to determine just what impact the show was having on audiences. Von Hodenberg summarizes that research in her book, writing, The satire got through to almost all, bar a very small group of diehard racists. In his time, Archie was clearly recognized as a negative model, a fool, and a loser, even by children. His general popularity with viewers was based less on his racism than on his traditionalism, his patriarchal, working-class, anti-counterculture, anti-welfare outlook. One of the major stumbling blocks of this research is it typically only looked at the audience at specific moments in time, rather than following them over the course of the show's run. For instance, did that small group of racists change along with Archie, or did they lose interest in the show? And how did the majority audience attitudes towards being humor using bigotry change over time? Did they become more permissive, or were they more sensitive to it being a hint at underlying racism? Or perhaps there was no impact at all, and what we have is simply people finding what they want out of a series and a character. Unfortunately, the social sciences don't offer us a firm answer to our question. More recently, writing for The New Yorker, Emily Nussbaum presented Archie Bunker as a figure that was one of the forefathers of a divisive lead. She wrote, Archie was the first masculine powerhouse to simultaneously charm and alienate viewers, and much like the men who came after him, he longed for an era when, guys like us, we had it made. O'Connor's noisy, tender, and sometimes frightening performance made the character unforgettable, but from the beginning he was a source of huge anxiety. Archie represented the danger and potential of television itself, its ability to influence viewers rather than merely help them kill time. Ironically, for a character so desperate to return to the past, he ended up steering the medium toward the future. There are numerous characters like these that seem almost willfully misinterpreted, from Tyler Durden to Walter White. So the phenomena isn't new and perhaps reveals that it's not that these characters change anyone, but rather attract different people for different reasons. So perhaps loving a bigot like Archie is simply a product of art being subjective, which is a bit too basic and tidy an answer. Carol O'Connor reflected on the impact of Archie, saying, Borderline bigots pushed over the edge by all in the family? That's a lot of baloney. I've been on college campuses. I have my MA, you know. And a lot of academics are harebrains who dream up issues. And who cares? I don't know what effect the show has had. Many people say good. A few bad. I don't know how to assess these judgments at all. It's more likely that the show hasn't had much of any kind of effect. I would guess not one way or the other. Norman Lear wrote, while some accused us of reinforcing racism through Archie's attitude, others gave us credit for exposing the absurdity of prejudice. I don't think either is true. As much as Archie reminded viewers of fathers, uncles, and neighbors, I don't recall a single letter that said, I see a lot of myself in Archie. That last line, I think, reveals one major limitation of the lovable bigot that Archie represents. He's immediately recognizable as a loved one in a person's life who hasn't grown with the changing social norms, and though he loves his family, the rest of the world he's not so keen about. In that respect, it's easy to understand and empathize with Archie as that lovable bigot. His prejudices aren't directed towards his family, with the exception of Michael being Polish, and even that fades when his grandson Joey is born, since he would never use an anti-Polish slur against him. 
The anti-atheism is another complaint Archie directs towards Michael and Gloria, though even that isn't quite the same as the vitriol we see him express towards other groups. If anything, Archie's proximity to these identities reveals a softening that comes with exposure, something that's generally seen in research on the subject. Meeting people of other backgrounds tend to soften the hard edges of a bigot, and sometimes help them grow into a more accepting person. Norman Lear based Archie on his father, and is a reflection of how, in spite of his father's bigotry, Norman still loved him. But had Norman's father bigotry been directed against Norman, would he still be able to say that? For instance, had Norman Lear been gay, would his father's homophobia impact the love that Norman has for him? The character of Archie and his softening seems to present that hope that, over time, perhaps he might grow to accept, ever so slightly, that part of him. The optimism that people, even someone like Archie, can change. Ironically, as the show slipped from Norman Lear's grasp, the character of Archie was able to grow into something that meant more than the portrait of a flawed man. You could even argue there was something aspirational there. Reality isn't always so kind, and many people who grew up gay, trans, atheist, or from some other minority community that represents a break from their parents' traditions. But perhaps the lasting impression we have from an Archie that changes is that, one day, maybe, things might be different. Those were the days. After Archie Bunker's place ended, Carol O'Connor would go on to star in In the Heat of the Night, the series would run for seven seasons and earn him one Emmy Award for lead actor in a drama series. Afterwards, he would appear in a number of guest roles on TV and film. After the passing of his son Hugh from an overdose, O'Connor dedicated much of his life to raising awareness of drug addiction. Carol O'Connor passed away on June 21, 2001 from a heart attack at 76. Jean Stapleton became increasingly involved with women's rights issues, and though she would typically insist on never doing the Edith Bunker voice again, she would allow representations of herself as Edith be used for charitable causes. Professionally, she would appear in countless guest appearances in movies and on TV shows, with her last roles being in Pursuit of Happiness and Like Mother Like Son, The Strange Story of Santi and Kenny Kimes. She passed away on March 31st, 2013 at the age of 90. Rob Reiner would move from acting to directing and have a string of hit movies in the 1980s including This Is Spinal Tap, Stand By Me, The Princess Bride, and When Harry Met Sally. He would continue to act in several roles throughout his career and currently is working on a sequel to Spinal Tap. Sally Struthers would appear on several TV shows and movies throughout her career, including Still Standing and Gilmore Girls. She's also appeared in productions of Annie, Hello Dolly, and has been performing on stage on a regular basis for over 20 years. All of the family left a stamp on American culture, in a sense quite literally as it got its own stamp in 1999. It gave us words like dingbad and meathead that have become part of the lexicon. Literally every day of my life, somebody will say, hey, meathead. All in the Family was such a cultural landmark that Archie and Edith's chairs were placed in the Smithsonian. The series changed people's perceptions of what a sitcom can be. Perhaps more than anything, it gave us so much to talk about. And in that conversation, a debate about what it meant. The legacy of All in the Family may always be one that is in some way divisive. Quoting one last time from Norman Lear's biography, As my grandfather was fond of saying, and as physicists confirm, when you throw a pebble in a lake, the water rises. It's far too infinitesimal a rise for our eyes to register, so all we can see is the ripple. People still say to me, We watched Archie as a family, and I'll never forget the discussions we had after the show. And so that was the ripple of All in the Family. Families talked. I had never really watched All in the Family before starting this project. I had caught a few clips here and there, and maybe I saw the odd episode when I was younger, but it didn't really have a big place in my memory. Having finally gone back and watched it, I can see what all the hype was about. It was a really special show, and I hope this video does some justice to its very large legacy. This was a labor of many hours and days, weeks, months, and if it's something you appreciated and enjoyed. I hope you do consider becoming a supporter of my channel, either by joining my Patreon or becoming a member. And as usual, like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Thank you all so much for watching.